In this video series, I will talk about the elementary proof of prime number theorem due to Selberg and Erdős. I plan to make this video series accessible to undergraduate students and ambitious high school students. What I expect the audience to know or accept are the following. First, I expect you to know the notion of prime numbers and the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, namely the unique factorization theorem or prime factorization theorem, which says any positive integer n greater than 1 can be written uniquely as a product of prime numbers. The second thing I assume the audience know is the binomial formula. I assume you know that a plus b raised to the nth power is equal to the summation from r equal to 0 to n of n choose r times a to the r times b to the n minus r, where this binomial coefficient n choose r is equal to n factorial divided by r factorial times n minus r factorial. And thirdly, I assume you know basic calculus. Namely, I expect you to know the limits and lim soup, or in a shorthand notation, lim with a bar above and a lim if using the shorthand notation, this is lim with bar below. And I assume you know the derivatives. and integrals, which are covered in the first theory calculus. And in particular, you have to know the fundamental theorem of calculus. Or in other words, the Newton-Leibniz theorem. So these are what I expect the audience to know. And now, let me also tell you what I don't expect you to know. I will not assume the audience have the knowledge of arithmetic functions. You don't have to know the meaning of mu, psi, theta, lambda, etc. And you don't have to know their properties. For example, you don't have to know the Morbius inversion formula or any asymptotic formulas concerning the summation of these functions. I will talk about these functions from scratch. With this being said, let's start our journey. Now we begin with a brief history of prime number theorem. The study of the distribution of prime numbers has fascinated mathematicians since antiquity. It is only in modern times, however, that a precise asymptotic law for the number of primes in arbitrary long intervals has been obtained. For real number x bigger than 1, we let pi of x denote the number of primes less than x. In notations, this means pi of x is the summation of 1's with p less than or equal to x and p lives in the set of primes. Throughout this video series, we will often omit the notation p in p and just write pi of x equal to 
the summation of ones where p less than or equal to x. With the understanding that uh, this lowercase p here always means prime. Another famous prime number theorem tells us that pi of x is asymptotically close to x divided by logarithm of x for large x. And next, we're going to make this notation more precise by introducing its rigorous mathematical definition. And actually, we're not just going to introduce this one notation, but a bunch of notations, which will be used throughout this video series. In this section, we'll make the terminology asymptotic more precise by introducing some asymptotic notations. There are six of them. Big O, little o, and this similar notation. The curved less than, the curved bigger than, and the curved equal sign. If you are already familiar with these notations, please feel free to skip to the next section of the video series. Otherwise, please follow me and I will introduce them carefully. Suppose that n is an integral variable which tends to infinity. And throughout this video, whenever you see n, it always means an integer. And x is a continuous variable which tends to infinity or zero. Or sometimes to some other limiting value. And also suppose that phi of n or phi of x is a positive function of n or x. And that f of n or f of x is any other function of n or x. With these notations and assumptions, we have first f equals big O of phi means the absolute value of f is less than a times phi, where a is the independent of n or x. For all values of n or x in question. And in particular, big O of 1 means bounded by a constant. Second, f equal to little o of phi means that the quotient f of phi goes to zero as the implicit variables n or x tends to some value. For example, when n goes to infinity or x goes to zero or infinity or some other value. As we mentioned in the previous page. And third, we write f similar to phi, and this notation means f over phi converges to 1. As n goes to infinity, or x tends to some value. As examples, the audience can immediately verify 10x is big O of x. Sine of x is 
big O of 1. x is big O of x squared. x is little o of x squared. Sine of x is little o of x. Log of x is little o of x delta for any delta greater than zero. And x plus 1 is similar to x, where x tends to infinity. And here, I would like to remind the audience that although you see x is equal to big O of x squared, and at the same time x is equal to little o of x squared, as x tends to infinity, this is actually not a contradiction. This is allowed here, because this notation means x will be bounded by some constant times x squared, and this notation means x divided by x squared will tend to 0 as x goes to infinity. They are both correct. And these two together do not mean big O of x squared is same as little of x squared. And as another group of examples, you can easily see x squared is big O of x. x squared is also little of x. Sine of x is similar to x. 1 plus x is similar to 1 when x tends to 0. And in particular, we observe that f equal to little of phi implies and is stronger than f equal to big O phi. Because if f divided by phi goes to zero, then f divided by phi must be bounded by a constant, or in other words, f is bounded by a constant times phi. And now we talk about the other three symbols. f curvely less than phi means f over phi goes to zero and this is equivalent to the notation f equal to little of phi. f curvely bigger than phi means f divided by phi goes to infinity. And finally, we write f curvely equal to phi, or we say f is asymptotic to phi, and this notation means f over phi is bounded below by a positive constant and also bounded above by a positive constant. Now here, two a's are not necessarily the same, but they must be both positive and independent of variables n and x. And here you can see a convention. The convention is that we shall often use a as an unspecified positive constant. Different a's usually have different values. 
even when they occur in the same formula. So this is a convention we're going to use throughout this video series. And the reason to do this is that we want to avoid introducing new notations. For example, we could write f bigger than a times v less than b times v, or f bigger than a times v less than a prime times v. But of course, you can see by doing so, we'll introduce new notations b and a prime. And sometimes mathematicians will easily run out of notations. So here we're going to just follow hardest approach and just write f bigger than a times v and less than a times v with the understanding that a here is different from the a here. Also, let me mention another remark. Here we are defining big O of phi and little of phi in isolation. What do we mean by this? We mean big O of phi denotes an unspecified f such that f is equal to big O of phi. And similarly for little of phi. With this kind of understanding, we can perform the following operations. For example, big O of 1 plus big of 1 is equal to big of 1. And this is equal to little of x when x goes to infinity. And this means if f is equal to big of 1 and g is equal to big of 1. So here we assign two functions to this unspecified notation big of 1. Then f plus g will be equal to big of 1. And f plus g is also equal to little of x as x goes to infinity. As another example, we may write if we sum up n minus big of ones, then we'll get big of n. So here we are using this vacuous notation new and we sum this big of 1 for new from 1 to n. And this means the sum of n terms each numerically less than a constant is numerically less than a constant multiple of n. And here, I would like to add another important remark. The relation equal asserted between big O or little symbols is not usually symmetrical. 
Thus, little of one can be equal to big of one. This is always true. But big of one equal to little of one is usually false. Since a quantity that tends to zero is always bounded. But a bounded quantity does not necessarily tend to zero. We may also observe that f similar to phi is equivalent to f equal to phi plus little phi or to f equal to phi times 1 plus little of 1. And now I have introduced all six notations. And sometimes I will use the informal notations x greater greater than 1 or n greater or greater than 1 meaning for sufficiently large x or n. Or more precisely, there exists a constant such that f bigger than that constant or n bigger than that constant. And finally, at the end of this section, let me emphasize that throughout this video series, variables x, y, t are real numbers greater or equal to 1. And the symbols m, n, h, k, etc. are positive integers. And in particular, whenever we use p, we always mean a prime number. Now let us return to the history of prime number theorem. Let's first restate the prime number theorem more rigorously. We will state it as theorem 6, as in Hardy's book. Throughout this video series, we will always use the same labeling as in Hardy's book. So the prime number theorem states that the limit as x goes to infinity of the ratio pi of x divided by x over log of x is equal to 1. Or, using the asymptotic notations we just introduced, pi of x is similar to x divided by log of x as x goes to infinity. This theorem was conjectured by Leranger and Gauss independently. Leranger formulated the approximation pi of x approximately equal to x divided by a times log of x plus b in 1798. And in 1808, he made it more precise with a equal to 1 
and b equal to a number a little bit less than 1. And a little bit earlier, Gauss took a different approach. When Gauss was only 15 or 16 years old, that was the year 1792 or 1793, this teenager observed that the density of the primes in the kiliad, namely an interval of length 1000. For example, the interval from x to x plus 1000. Gauss observed that the density of primes in such intervals will decrease approximately as 1 over log of x. And this leads to the approximation that pi of x is roughly the integral of logarithm of t from 2 to x dt. But neither the rounder or Gauss gave a rigorous proof. The first breakthrough was made by Chebyshev. in 1852 and he proved in an elementary way that now we will state this as theorem 7 Chebyshev's theorem states that pi of x is asymptotic to x divided by log of x as x goes to infinity and more precisely, he showed that the pi of x divided by the ratio x over log of x is bounded below by b and bounded above by 6 over 5 times b, with b roughly equal to a number slightly below 1. And 6b over 5 is roughly a number slightly bigger than 1. The first actual proofs of prime number theorem was obtained by Hartmut and Poulsen in 1896. But unfortunately, the proof was not elementary and actually made use of Hartmann theory of integral functions applied to the Riemann zeta function. Namely, zeta of s. This series is absolutely convergent when the real part of s is bigger than 1. And following this, they also use a clever application of a trigonometric identity, which we will not discuss here. And now it comes to the really amazing part. In the year 1948, a truly elementary proof of prime number theorem that only uses basic calculus involving logarithm and elementary number theory. It was discovered by Erdős and Selberg. However, there was a bitter dispute 
between these two famous mathematicians, which we will not talk about in this video. I would like to refer the audience to an article of Goldfield for more details of this story. And with this, I finish a brief introduction to the history of the prime number theorem. And starting from next section, we will formally enter the elementary proof of prime number theorem, which essentially follows the spirit of the proof due to Selberg. The proof of prime number theorem depends largely on two functions, theta of x and psi of x. These two functions are defined through the summation on the log of primes, which we are going to introduce in this section of the video series. Theta of x is relatively easier to define. For real number x equal to 1, as we always assume throughout this video series, theta of x is defined as the summation of log of p for prime p less than or equal to x. Whenever you see p in the sum, it always means a prime. So this is not a summation over all integers less than or equal to x. This is a summation for all prime numbers less than or equal to x. And this is also equal to the log of the product of p with p less than or equal to x. So this is the definition of theta of x. The psi of x is harder to define. To define psi of x, we first need to define a function called lambda. So lambda of n is equal to log of p if n is a power of a prime that is not equal to 1. So here, the exponential m is at least 1. m is not supposed to be 0. And lambda of n is equal to 0 if n is not a power of prime. And let me emphasize that in particular, lambda 1 is equal to 0. And now we define psi of x as the summation of lambda of n with n less than or equal to x. And number theorists may also want to write this as a double sum. First, for each positive integer m, you look at the summation for all primes less than or equal to x to the 1 over mth power of log of p. And then you take the summation for all positive power m. For each x bigger to 1, you will see for if m is large enough, this x to 1 over m will go to 1. And as a result, there will be no prime p less than or equal to x to 1 over m for large m. It's not hard to see that these two definitions are the same. Because p to the m less than or equal to x is equivalent to p less than or equal to x to 1 over m. So this is precisely the summation for all integer less than or equal to x of lambda of n. To make the audience understand these definitions better, let me compute the following example. For x equal to 10.7, let's compute the theta of 10.7 and the psi of 10.7. You might want to pause this video for a while and compute by yourself. 
but I will give you the answer anyway. So first, what is theta of 10.7? By definition, this is a summation of all the log of p with p less than or equal to 10.7. So what are the primes less than or equal to 10.7? There are four primes less than or equal to 10.7, and they are 2, 3, 5, and 7. And we take the log and sum them up. This is equal to what? This is equal to log of 2 times 3 times 5 times 7, which is log of 210. And now what about psi of 10.7? To compute this, we first write this as a summation of lambda of n for n less than or equal to 10.7. And now we look at what are the powers of primes less than or equal to 10.7. Because in the definition of lambda, the only non-zero terms are those which are powers of primes. So we will sum up the following powers of primes. 2, 4, 8. 3, 9, 5, and 7. We first take the lambda function of those uh, powers of primes and sum them up. And this sum is equal to log of 2 plus log of 2 plus log of 2 plus log of 3 plus log of 3 plus log of 5 plus log of 7, just by definition. So you can combine them. I will just leave this as it is, without further combining them. But from this example, I would like to make two remarks. The first remark I would like to make here is, as you can see from the previous example, if the m's power of p is the highest power of p, not exceeding x, then log of p occurs precisely m times in the sum psi of x. Following the first remark, we can write a formula for psi of x as a summation for all primes less than or equal to x of log of p with the coefficient the floor of log of x divided by log of p. And by the change of basis formula for log functions, this is equal to log base p of x floor times log of p. So what does this coefficient mean? The coefficient here exactly means the highest power of m, such that p to the m is the highest power of p, not exceeding x. So these coefficients exactly correspond to 
those amps. So these are the two remarks I'd like to make following the previous example. And now the audience might wonder, why do we care about the functions for psi of x and theta of x? This is because later we'll see that we have the asymptotic relations between pi of x, theta of x, and psi of x in such a way as x goes to infinity. And thus, to show pi of x is similar to x over log of x as x goes to infinity, it suffices to show theta of x is similar to x or psi of x is similar to x as x goes to infinity. And let me make a heuristic comparison. Just comparing pi of x, which is by definition the number of primes less equal to x, and theta of x, which by definition log of p is p less equal to x. By comparing them, one should really expect that theta of x is about log of x times of pi of x. So from here, one should expect the asymptotic relation that the pi of x is similar to theta of x divided by log of x. And now, we'll study the relation between the growth rates of psi of x and theta of x. And we'll prove this is theorem 413 in Hardest book, psi of x is equal to theta of x plus big O of this function square root of x times square of log of x. So how do we prove this? To see this, we first observe that psi of x is equal to by the definition as I mentioned from here, you can write psi of x as a double sum, where this outer sum is for all positive integer m, and the integer sum is really equivalent to p to the m less equal to x, namely some power of p less equal to x. So I'm summing up all such log of p's. So this is the definition. And how is this related to theta? You can see from this part, so this part is precisely equal to theta of x to 1 over m. So plus f x is equal to summation for m from 1 to infinity of theta of x to 1 over m. This guy looks like an infinite sum, but it is indeed a finite sum, as we commented before. And the limit of x to 1 over m, when m goes to infinity, is equal to 1, because we always assume that x is bigger to 1. And when x to 1 over m is less than 2, you can see from the definition of theta, that theta of x to 1 over m is equal to 0. 
because there are no prime numbers less than 2. 1 is not a prime number. And now let's continue this argument. As we discussed above, the sum is actually a finite sum, and it will terminate when x to 1 over m is less than 2. So we are really summing over those m's with x to 1 over m bigger or equal to 2. And this is a finite sum. And it will be equal to the summation from m equal to 1 to the floor of log of x divided by log of 2 of theta of x to 1 over m. You can see this from here by taking the log of both sides and solve it for m. And now, what about each summit theta of x to 1 over m? This function is the summation of log of p's with p less than or equal to x to 1 over m. And we're going to upper bound this by majorizing each summit log of p to log of x to 1 over m. And this is really just a dump sum of log of x for all primes less than or equal to x to 1 over m. And now we're going to further majorize this by. So here we are counting all primes less than or equal to x to 1 over m. Now let's not only just count primes, but count all the integers less than or equal to x to 1 over m. Now what do we get? We get an upper bound 1 over m times x to 1 over m times log of x. So this is really a trivial upper bound. We are ignoring the fact that we are only summing over primes. And if m is bigger than 2, this is going to less than or equal to the square root of x times log of x. So here, x is always bigger than 1, and this part will be monotonically decreasing as m increases. And now we are going to plug this estimate for theta of x to the power m back into here. So what do we get? By splitting it into two parts, for m equal to 1 and for m greater than or equal to 2. We first single out the sum and when m is equal to 1, which is simply theta of x. And the other part, the summation from m equal to 2 to this floor of log of x divided by log of 2. Of theta of x to 1 over m. So this second part is less than or equal to log of x divided by log of 2 times the estimate we just got, which is square root of x times log of x. This part is true for m bigger or equal to 2. And we majorize the sum by majorizing each individual term to this guy times an upper bound for the number of summons here. So the number of summons here is upper bounded by this number log of x divided by log of 2. But what is this? 
There are asymptotic notations. This is precisely an example of big O of what? Square root of x times log of x squared. Which is exactly what we need to prove in theorem 413. And in particular, as a corollary to the theorem, sin of x is similar to x if and only if theta of x is similar to x. Because, look, the difference between sin of x and theta of x is something that grows slower than x. Because log of x squared, this guy, grows slower than any power of x. And square root of x is also a lower power of x. So they together will grow slower than x, which is a classical fact in calculus. And recall from our discussion here, to show the prime number theorem, it suffices to prove that theta of x is similar to x, or psi of x is similar to x. Now we have seen that these two statements are actually equivalent to each other. So it suffices to show just one of them. And hence, proving either side of this equivalence will give us the prime number theorem. But this is highly non-trivial. However, we're going to show in the next section a weaker statement. We will show that plus f x is asymptotic to x and theta of x is also asymptotic to s. And remember, this means although we do not know whether the limit of plus f x over x or theta of x over x goes to 1, we know this ratio will be squeezed between two constants. And here, remember, we always use the same unspecified constant a for all constants like this. This is what we're going to prove in the next section, which will later imply the Chebyshev theorem, a weaker statement of the prime number theorem. In this section of the video series, we are going to prove a theorem concerning the order of growth of theta of x and psi of x. We will show that they are of order x. Remember, as I stated from the beginning, a here is always an unspecified constant. And throughout this video series, we always use the same labeling as in Hardest book. Now recall from the previous section of the video series, we established the following relation between psi of x and theta of x. Therefore, in view of the theorem for 13, it suffices to show theta of x has an upper bound that is a multiple of x, and psi of x has a lower bound that is also a multiple of x. Of course, those two a's are not the same, but unspecified constant. You can see immediately 
once we established these two relations, then because the difference between psi of x and theta of x is a term that grows slower than x as x goes to infinity, we'll establish both of these relations. Let us establish the first inequality. And more precisely, we'll show the following. And we'll write this as a theorem for 15, which states that theta of n is less than twice of n times log of 2 for all n greater or equal to 1. So here, the constant in front of n will be 2 times log of 2. And it follows from this statement, you see this statement, you see in this statement, n is a discrete variable. It is uh, for all positive integers. Now, how to turn this into the continuous variable? For a continuous variable x, set of x but the monotonicity of theta is always less than or equal to the theta of the ceiling of x, the smallest positive integer bigger than x. Here x is always a number bigger or equal to 2. And this guy is the integer. So by our theorem for 15, we have this term less than twice of the ceiling times log of 2. And now, by the property of the ceiling function, this is less than 2x plus 2 log of 2, which is less than or equal to 4x log of 2. And this part is true whenever x is bigger to 1. We are now trying to find the most optimal choice for A. So now you see, in order to establish this equation, now you see it suffices for us to consider the discrete variable case. Now how do we prove theorem 415? The proof is done by induction on the variable n. And suppose, first, if n is equal to 1 or n is equal to 2, then the statement is trivial. Because by definition of theta, theta of 1 is 0. And the theta of 2, because 2 is a prime number, is equal to log of 2, which is also less than 2 times 2 times log 2. Now, suppose the statement is true for all n less than equal to n naught minus 1. And we are going to prove this statement for n equal to n naught. And that completes the mathematical induction. And now we'll divide the proof based on the parity of n naught. If n naught is even, and n naught bigger than 2. Because we have already seen trivially that when n is equal to 2, we have this inequality. So now let's focus on a case when n naught is bigger than 2. Then, if you look at theta of n's definition, by definition, this is a summation of log of p's, where p 
is a prime number less than a naught. Now, because n is an even number, and an even number bigger than 2 is never a prime. So, the sum is also equal to the summation for all prime numbers less than or equal to a naught minus 1 of log of p's. So this is because n as an even integer is not a prime number. And now we are ready to use the induction hypothesis. But the induction hypothesis, this is less than or equal to twice of n naught minus 1 times log of 2, which is less than twice of n naught times log of 2. And this completes the proof when n naught is even. Now, what happens when n naught is out? If n naught is out, say n naught is equal to 2m plus 1. And now we have theta of n naught is equal to theta of 2m plus 1. And now comes a very tricky step. So this is a very tricky step in the proof. We're going to split this theta of 2m plus 1 in two parts. And now, because m plus n now will be less than n naught. Therefore, the induction hypothesis applies to this part. By induction hypothesis, we shall abbreviate as IH. Theta of m plus 1 is less than or equal to twice of m plus 1 times log of 2. So it suffices to give a good bond for this difference. Now how to bond this difference? This difference, by definition, is a summation of log p when p ranges from m plus 2 all the way to 2m plus 1. So p is bigger than m plus 1, less than or equal to 2m plus 1. And you can write this as a product. So this will be log of the product for p bigger than m plus 1, less than or equal to 2m plus 1. And now the rest of the proof involves a little combinatorics. Combinatorics is tricky but elementary. I will make the following claim. We claim that this product divides the combinatorial coefficient 2m plus 1 choose m, which is also 2m plus 1 choose m plus 1. By definition, this is a product from m plus 1 to 2m plus 1 divided by m factorial. Remember, I assume the audience are familiar with the binomial theorem, including those binomial coefficients. Now, why is this claim true? This claim is true because each prime p 
p from m plus 2 to 2m plus 1 divides the product from m plus 2 to 2m plus 1. And by the elementary number theory, and in particular by the unique factorization theorem of integers, we know that these distinct primes must also divide this whole product, given that each factor divides some of them. But at the same time, because p starts from m plus 2, each factor must be co-prime to the m factorial in the denominator. So, this claim follows. And in particular, it follows from this claim that if this product divides this binomial coefficient, then we have it must be less than or equal to it. So this is a classical trick of number theories to show the one integer is less than or equal to another, you show the first integer actually divides the second. And now you look at this binomial coefficient. We claim that this guy is less than or equal to half of 2 to the 2m plus 1, which is simply 2 to the 2m. And why is this true? This is true because in the binomial expansion of 1 plus 1, to, which is equal to 2 to the 2m plus 1, in the binomial expansion of this, the term 2m plus 1 delta m appears actually twice. Once in this form, once s just 2m plus 1 choose m, and once s 2m plus 1 choose m plus 1. And you know they are actually equal. So this guy appears twice. And in particular, twice of this guy is less than 2 to the 2m plus 1. So one of them is less than or equal to this guy divided by 2. This explains this inequality. So now we have established that this product is less than or equal to 2 to the 2m. And the only thing that we are left to do is to plug in this inequality back to this parenthesis. And you will see the difference between those two thetas is less than or equal to log of 2 to the 2m. which is equal to 2m times log of 2. And thus, theta of 2m plus 1, by this splitting trick, is less than or equal to 2m times log of 2 plus, and remember, this part was bounded by the induction hypothesis. And this is equal to twice of n naught times log of 2. And therefore, we are done with the proof of theorem 450. The proof is a bit tricky. First, we use induction on n, and it divided 
into two cases based on whether the number is uh, even or odd. The even case is relatively easier, but the, the odd part is quite involved. We use this uh, separation trick and we try to find the upper bound for this product, the product of prime numbers. And that upper bound is established by finding something that is, on one hand, divisible by this product, on the other hand, bounded above by some power of 2, where we seriously used the binomial theorem and the binomial coefficients. For beginners, it's really difficult to think of such a proof. What we just established is the upper bound for theta of x. Now to prove the other inequality, namely, psi of x is bigger than some constant multiple of x. We need the following fact on the prime factorization of factorials. Which is the decomposition of n factorial into the product of powers of primes, where each exponent j of n comma p is equal to the summation of the floor of n divided by p to the m, and perhaps a more common notation is nu sub p of n factorial. In number theory, this notation means the periodic valuation or periodic order of n factorial. Theorem 416 is often referred to as the so called Legendre's formula. And to help the audience understand this theorem, let me give you the following example. For n equals to 6, let's look at the factorization of 6 factorial. 6 factorial is equal to 720, and its prime factorization is equal to 2 to the 1st times 3 squared times 5. And the exponents j of 6, 2, which is also nu sub 2 of 6 factorial, is equal to 4. And this 4 can also be computed through the rounders formula by summing up the floor of n divided by powers of p. So in this case, 4 is equal to the summation from i equal to 1 to infinity of 6 divided by 2 to the i. And there are only two non-zero terms in this sum, which is 6 divided by 2 plus 6 divided by 4. And this is 3 plus 1, which is indeed equal to 4. And similarly, j of 6, 3, which is new sub 3 of 6 factorial. Here it is equal to 2. And there is only one sum end, which is 6 divided by 3, which is 2. And similarly, you can compute j of 6, 5. This is 1. Now how do we prove the rounders formula? To prove this, 
will count the exponent to the prime p in the factorization smartly. First, let me show you the Wikipedia's proof. Wikipedia says the following. Since n factorial is a product of the integers 1 through n, we obtain at least one factor of p in n factorial for each multiple of p in the set 1, 2, all the way to n. Of each, there are the floor of n divided p many. And now, each multiple of p squared, now we are looking at p squared, contributes an additional factor of p. And each multiple of p cubed contributes yet another factor of p, etc. And if we add up the number of these factors, we'll get this infinite sum for new sub p of n factorial. I'm not sure how much you are satisfied with this Wikipedia's proof. At least I am not satisfied, because this is too sketchy, and when I read this proof, I don't really know what's going on here. Instead, I would like to just call this the idea of the proof. And I will give you another proof, which I think is more rigorous, but essentially follows uh, the same idea. To make this proof more rigorous, we're going to write an algorithm. And the algorithm will do the counting for this uh, j of np, or new sub p of n factorial for us. So my proof below will look like an algorithm. However, for those who think this proof is good enough, please feel free to skip to the next section of the video series. To make the proof more rigorous, we will examine the integers from 1 to n and their divisors, which are powers of p. Now for each l from 1 to n, we consider the prime factorization of l as so this l is equal to p to the power r sub l times other prime factors. Now we will only focus on this p to the r sub l's power, and we will not write down other prime factors explicitly. Then, what is n factorial? n factorial will be the product of those l's, which will be p to the r1 plus r2 plus the dot rn times other prime factors. But again, we are only going to focus on this part. And we are going to show that this sum of r1 plus r2 all the way to rn, now we claim that this sum is equal to the summation of n divided by pm for m bigger to 1. Now to see this claim, we will count the sum r1 plus r2 plus the dot rn in a different way. 
And this way will be our algorithm, the so-called algorithm. What we do is that we first subtract 1 from each of R1 through Rn that are at least 1. Namely, if some R sub i is 0, we will leave it alone. Otherwise, it is at least 1, and we will subtract 1 from them. Now let me ask the audience a question. So how many of R1 through Rn are at least 1? And note that this is equivalent to asking that how many of the n consecutive integers 1, 2, 3 through n are multiples of p. Do you see why they are equivalent? They are equivalent because of our definition for r1 through rn. Remember, by our construction, n factorial is equal to p to the r1 plus the, the rn times other prime factors, where each l is defined as r sub l times other prime factors. So, you can see it's precisely equal to the number of integers here that are at least 1, namely non-zero. Because if a particular R sub L is 0, then that particular L is not a multiple of P. And vice versa. If R sub L is at least 1, then L is a multiple of p. So these two questions are equivalent. Now, what is the answer to this question? How many integers here are multiples of p? You think about it a little bit, and you should realize immediately, so how many here? They are precisely the floor of n developed p, many integers that are multiples of p. And now we are going to perform a surgery. The surgery here is we will subtract the floor of n developed p, many once from R1 plus R2 plus Rn. Namely, whenever sub R sub L is at least 1, then we will subtract 1 from there. So in total, we will subtract exactly the floor of n divided by p times 1. And now we suppose the remaining terms after this operation are correspondingly R1 superscript 1, R2 superscript 1, all the way to Rn superscript 1. And you should be able to see immediately what is the relation between Rk superscript 1 and Rk. So it will be either R sub k or I sub k minus 1, depending whether Rk is 0 or not. And this is further equal to 0 if Rk is less than or equal to 1, 
or rk minus 1 if rk is at least 2. Hopefully, you should be able to see this uh, clearly. And now we repeat what we have done above. Now we subtract 1. Again, from each of R11, R21, all the way to Rn1. That are at least 1. And now let me ask you the question again. How many of R11 R21 through Rn1 are at least 1. Know that this question is equivalent to how many of R1, R2 through Rn are at least 2 based on our relations, namely the relations here. And again, this question is equivalent to asking how many of the integers from 1 to n are multiples of p squared. Do you see why they are equivalent? If you don't see, again, you go back to this definition. That R sub L is at least 2 if and only if P squared is a divisor of L, or L is a multiple of P squared. So how many of them are multiples of p squared? The answer is, like before, n divided by p squared floor. Because from 1 to n, p squared twice p squared all the way to p squared times n divided by p squared floor are precisely those are multiples of p squared. So in total, we will subtract the floor of n divided by p squared many ones from the sum r11 plus r21 plus the rn1. And again, suppose the remaining terms after this operation are r12, r22, all the way to rn2. Where you can see Rk2 is either equal to Rk1 or Rk1 minus 1, depending on whether this guy is 0 or not. And this is in turn equal to 0 if Rk is less than or equal to 2, or Rk minus 2 if Rk is bigger than 2. So this is the relation between Rk2 and Rk. And now we subtract 1 once again from each of 
R12, R22 through Rn2. That are at least one. And get R13, R23, all the way to Rn3. With Rk3 equal to 0, or Rk minus 3, depending on whether Rk is less than equal to 3 or not. And this algorithm will go on and will terminate in finite steps. And in total, we'll subtract how many? n divided by p factorial plus n divided by p squared factorial plus da 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 many ones from r1 plus r2 plus da 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 R n. And in the end, we will turn the sum into zero. And hence, because our subtraction algorithm will eventually turn the sum into zero, that means this sum must be precisely equal to the summation of quantities that we have taken from this sum. And it follows that n factorial, which is the product of the powers p with exponents r1 plus dot dot rn, the product of j of n comma p is power of p. With this guy equal to the sum precisely by definition. And this finishes the proof of the rounders formula. And hope that this proof looks more formal than the Wikipedia's proof. Now let us return to the proof that Poseidon x is bounded below by a times x. And recall when we did the upper bound for theta of x, we first prove a discrete version. Namely, we prove that theta of n is bounded by some constant times n for all positive integers n. And now for Poseidon x, we're going to do the same thing. We'll first discretize it. We let n equal to the floor of half of x. Then, by monotonicity of Poseidon of x, Poseidon of x is bigger or equal to Poseidon of 2n. And now let's prove the Poseidon to n is bigger or equal to logarithm of 2n choose n. And we will use this claim to finish our proof. To prove this claim, we're going to use the rounders formula. And now let's look at the binomial coefficient 2n choose n. By the Lagrangeus formula from the previous section, this is equal to and observe that both 
numerator and denominator are finite products, and the exponents will become zero for large piece. For whole large, we can choose the upper bound for p that serves the upper limit for these products. And one choice of such is 2n. But as you can see, when I choose p less or equal to 2n, it is too generous for the denominator. Maybe you want to say, OK, we should choose p less or equal to n. But it doesn't matter, because for those p bigger than n, these exponents will always become 0. So if you like, you can rewrite this as p less equal to n. But I want to say that this is just equal to the product for all p less than equal to 2n, because those actual terms will be p to the 0, which are 1s. And now you further simplify this as a product for p less equal to 2n of p to the exponents, the summation of the floor of 2n divided by p to the m minus twice of the floor of n divided by p to the m for all positive integer m. And of course, this is a finite sum, because both terms will vanish for large m. And now we take the log of both sides. What do we get? So log of 2n choose n will be the summation for p less equal to n of And now let's look at this part. Let's analyze this sum. As I commented above, the sum is a finite sum. And it will terminate before p to the m reaches 2m. So whenever p to the m is bigger than 2m, both terms will vanish. So we'll do a truncation here. And now we make a very important observation. We observe that the individual summons is either equal to 1 or 0, depending on whether the floor of 2 and by pm is odd or even. So how do we verify this? To verify, we let 2n divided by p to the m be equal to 2l plus 1 plus x or 2l plus x, depending on whether the floor of this guy is even or odd. Then it follows that n divided by p to the m is equal to l plus 1 half plus x over 2 or l plus half of x. Here, x is bigger than equal to 0 and less than 1. And therefore, if you take the difference of 2 divided by pm floor and twice of n divided by pm floor, it is equal to 2l plus 1 minus 2l equal to 1 in the first case. Remember, this is the case when 2n divided by pm's floor is odd. And for the other case, this is equal to 2l divided by 2l. 
which is zero. And this case happens when the floor of 2n divided by pm is even. And this verifies this equation. But what we actually need is just that each individual summand is bounded above by 1. So now let's go back to this sum. The sum is bounded above just by the summation of once. And this can be rewritten as m from 1 to, so the upper limit will be log of 2n divided by log of p. If you just take the log of the both sides of inequality, you will see this immediately. And this is simply just the floor of log of 2n divided by log of p. And therefore, log of 2n divided by n is less than or equal to the summation for p less than or equal to 2n of the sum over m times log of p. So now let's move this to here and observe that this sum, we just show that this guy is bounded by the floor of log 2n divided by log of p. So this is an upper bound we got for log of 2n choose n. But the right hand side is precisely equal to psi of 2n. Do you know why? This is because a remark we made much earlier, right after the definition for psi. But the remark over here, the second remark after the definition of psi, we have this identity. The psi of x, the summation for all primes less equal to x of the floor of log of x divided by log of p times log of p. And this proves the claim, which says log of 2n choose n is less than or equal to psi of 2n. And now let's finish the proof for the lower bound for psi of x. Psi of x, by our choice of n, remember, n was chosen as the floor of x divided by 2. And by the claim, this is bigger or equal to log of 2n divided by n. And now let's plug in the definition for 2n choose n. This is equal to 2n factorial divided by n factorial squared, which is 2n times 2n minus 1 all the way to n plus 1. And denominator you get the product from n to 1. By comparing the each factor in the numerator and denominator, you will see immediately this is bigger or equal to log of 2n. And this is equal to n times log of 2, which by definition of n is the floor of x divided by 2 times log of 2, which is bounded below by x divided by 4 times log of 2, because we have to drop this floor. And this inequality is true for x bigger equal to 2. So this proves 
the percent of x is bounded below by some constant multiple of x. And finally, this finishes the proof that theta and psi are of order x. Now we are ready to prove the following weaker version of prime number theorem due to Chebyshev, which states that pi of x grows at the same rate as x divided by log of x as x goes to infinity. Although we cannot infer from the theorem that pi of x divided by this quantity goes to 1 as x goes to infinity. In the first place, let us establish the lower bound for pi of x. The definition, theta of x is the sum of log of p's with p less than or equal to x. And now, we are going to measure the sum by considering the maximum of log of p's. Log of p's here can be upper bounded by log of x. And when we will pull out the log of x from here, the rest will be bounded by the sum of 1's for p less than or equal to x, which is precisely pi of x. However, it follows that pi of x, which is bigger or equal to theta of x divided by log of x, but the theorem for 15 we just proved which states that theta of x is asymptotically equivalent to x and in particular it is bounded with some constant multiple of x and now we divide by log of x and this proves the lower bound for pi of x namely pi of x is bigger than some constant multiple of x divided by log of x. On the other hand, to show the upper bound, we take delta, the number between 0 and 1. From the definition, if we make a truncation at p equal to x to the 1 minus delta. If you take the following truncation, we get an inequality. And this can be bounded below if we replace log of p by x to the 1 minus delta, which is 1 minus delta times log of x times the summation p from x to the 1 minus delta to x. And we simplify this using the definition of p of x, the sum is equal to pi of x minus pi of x to the 1 minus delta. And the last line can be further bounded below by now we can simply replace this pi of x to the 1 minus delta by x to the 1 minus delta. Because it is obvious that the pi of something is less than or equal to that something. So, from here, we solve for pi of x. What is pi of x? Pi of x is less than or equal to 
they took x divided by 1 minus delta log of x plus x to 1 minus delta. So this is what we can solve from this inequality. And these two terms can be upper bounded by first observe that theta of x can be upper bounded by some constant times x. And for the second term, x to 1 minus delta, we claim it is bounded by some constant times x divided by log of x. This is because log of x grows slower than x to the delta. So this part is by theorem for 14. And this part is by the fact that uh, log of x grows slower than any positive power of x. And uh, these two terms together is just uh, some constant multiple of x divided by log of x. And this establishes the upper bound for pi of x. So now, we can summarize, and this finishes the proof for the chip shift theorem. The proof of the chip shift theorem also gives us the following relations between pi of x, theta of x, and psi of x. which reduces our job of establishing the prime number theorem to establishing that the theta of x and psi of x are similar to x when x goes to infinity. To prove these relations, we first observe that by theorem for 13, which states that the difference between theta of x and psi of x is big O of the square root of x times log of x squared. And by theorem for 14, theta of x and psi of x are both asymptotic to x. Although we don't know if the ratio of theta of x divided by x or psi of x divided by x converges to 1 as x goes to infinity. From theorem for 13, we know the limit as x goes to infinity of theta of x minus psi of x divided by x is 0. And if you divide both numerator and denominator of x, the numerator will become theta of x divided by psi of x minus 1. And denominator will be x divided by psi of x. So this means the limit as x equal to infinity of this quotient is equal to zero. But, but this denominator from, from theorem for 14 is bounded below and above by two positive constants. Therefore, it forces that the numerator also goes to zero. In other words, theta of x divided by psi of x has limit 1 
as x goes to infinity. And this proves this part of the relation. So now it suffices to prove that pi of x is similar to theta of x divided by log of x. In order to prove this relation, we recall two inequalities we established from the proof of chips of zero. The first inequality is that theta of x is less than or equal to log of x times pi of x. And the second inequality is that theta of x is bounded below by 1 minus delta times log of x times pi of x minus x to 1 minus delta for any delta between 0 and 1. So let me copy them here. And combining this, we obtain that pi of x times log of x divided by theta of x is bounded below by 1 and above by So these two are just a straightforward computation from these two inequalities. Now for any epsilon greater than 0, we choose delta greater than 0 such that 1 over 1 minus delta less than 1 plus epsilon divided by 2. So as long as delta is small enough, this inequality must be satisfied. And since theta of x is asymptotic to x by theorem for 14, we can choose x0 depending on delta and epsilon, which in turn only depends on epsilon, because this delta is chosen to be dependent on epsilon only, such that for any x bigger than x0, we have uh, this guy, if you break it up, you will see write it as the product of three things. This part is bounded, this part is a constant. But this part, as x goes to infinity, it goes to zero. So, as long as we choose x not to be large enough, the product of these three must be less than epsilon divided by 2. And if you combine this part with this 1 over 1 minus delta, which is uh, less than 1 plus epsilon divided by 2, you will see that this guy is squeezed between 1 and 1 plus epsilon divided by 2 plus epsilon divided by 2. For all x bigger than x0, which is something that only depends on epsilon. And now by the definition of limit, we have the limit of pi of x times log of x, thereby uh, theta of x is equal to 1, which means by our asymptotic notation, pi of x is similar to theta of x divided by log of x. And this finishes the proof of theorem 420. Now, as a byproduct of Chibs theorem, let us establish 
the following. We let P1, P2 and so on be the list of primes in increasing order. Then, what is the size of the nth prime in this list? Chapter's theorem will tell us the size of the nth prime will be roughly n times log of n. And now let's prove this. First, by the definition for p sub n, because p sub n is the nth prime, we must have by definition of pi that pi of pn is precisely n. Namely, they are precisely n primes, less than or equal to the nth prime, which by theorem 7 is bounded about by some constant times p of n divided by log of pn. So this is by theorem 7 and this is by definition. So, p sub n is bounded below by some constant times n times log of p sub n. So this a here, remember, as an unspecified constant, is different from a from here. In this situation, actually, this a here is a reciprocal of the a here. But we are going to use the same letter anyway. And how is this guy compared with this guy? You should be able to immediately realize that p of n is actually bigger than n. Because the nth prime must be bigger than the nth positive integer. So this establishes the lower bound for p of n regarding this asymptotical relation. On the other hand, we also have that n, which is equal to pi of pn, is bigger than some constant times p sub n divided by log of p sub n. And here comes the tricky part. We're going to speed this as square root of p sub n times square root of p sub n divided by log of p sub n. It follows that the square root of p sub n is bounded above by some constant times log of p sub n divided by square root of p sub n times n. But p sub n will go to infinity as n goes to infinity. And log of p sub n will grow slower than square root of p sub n. So they together is less than some constant times n. And this implies that p sub n is bounded above by a times n squared for some unspecified constant a. And hence, p sub n, which is from this inequality bounded above by a times n log of p sub n and uh, so let me mark so this is from here and in the next step we're going to use this inequality to bound it again by some constant times n times log of 
n squared, which is again some constant times n times log of n by moving this uh, exponent to the front. And this completes the proof of theorem 8. So far, we have proved the chip chip theorem, which says that pi of x, the number of prime numbers less than or equal to x, is asymptotically x divided by log of x up to a constant. And you may want to ask, with chip chip theorem in hand, how far are we from our ultimate goal of proving the elementary number theorem, which states that these two quantities ratio converge to 1 as x goes to infinity. You might think we are not too far away from this, but unfortunately, the answer is no. Although the proof leading all the way to Chipsev theorem is already very technical, the eventual elementary proof for the prime number theorem is still a lot more involved and technical. And you can see this from the history of the prime number theorem. The Chipshift theorem was established in 1852. But the first elementary proof of the prime number theorem was not obtained until the year 1948. So there is almost a 100 year gap between these two proofs. And you can imagine how many mathematicians have tried very hard to find the elementary proof for the prime number theorem. To give the proof of the prime number theorem in the following sections of the video series, I will discuss a few results from calculus as well as elementary number theory, which will serve as foundations for elementary proof of prime number theorem. In this section, we are going to introduce two formal transformations in calculus, which will be useful in general in analytic number theory. And we will summarize them as theorem 421. Suppose that C1, C2, etc. is a sequence of numbers that the function C of t means the summation of C sub n's for n less than equal to t and that f of t is any function of t. Then, we have the following summation formula. This formula tells us we can sum up c sub n times f of n for n less than or equal to x in another way. By summing up those c sub n's times the increments in f of n. And there's a remainder term, c of x times f of floor of x. So this is our first formal transformation. The second transformation stays as follows. If, in addition, that c sub j is equal to 0 for j less than n1 and f of t 
has a continuous derivative for t bigger or equal to n1. Then the summation can also be written as c of x times f of x minus the integral from n1 to x of c of t times f prime of t dt. And later we're going to refer these two transformations as 22.5.1 and 22.5.2 as are labeled in Hardest book. In literature, these two transformations are often referred to as elbow's summation or summation by parts. Although in this video series, I will make it very specific. Whenever we use these two transformations, I will code them directly instead of saying elbow summation or summation by parts. And now let's prove these two transformations. The proof is not hard, but it requires really careful calculation. To prove the first formula, we're going to rewrite the sum using the definition of C of t's. And now we regroup these terms. And don't forget the last term, c of the floor of x times f of floor of x. But remember, by definition, this guy is simply equal to c of x, by definition. So, this verifies this 22.5.1. This is exactly the right hand side in 22.5.1. And now to see the other transformation, we're going to use Newton Leibniz formula. Or the fundamental theorem of calculus. That f of n minus f of n plus 1 is equal to the negative, the integral from n to n plus 1 of f prime of t dt. Remember, in this situation, we assume that f has continuous derivative for t bigger or equal to some n1. And remember, the definition of c of t, it is equal to c of n for t bigger or equal to n less than n plus 1. So, c of n times f of n minus f of n plus 1 is equal to the integral from n to n plus 1 of c of n times f prime of t dt for n bigger or equal to n1. And remember, we assumed that c sub j is 0 for j less than n1. Hence, c of x is equal to 0 for all x 
less than n1. And therefore, the summation of c sub n, f of n, for n less than or equal to x, by 22.5.1, we just proved, this is equal to And now apply the formula we just obtained to this sum. We get Now putting this sum and this integral together, we get the integral from n1 all the way to x. And that finishes the proof of the second formula. So this is equal to c of x times f of x minus the integral from and 1 all the way to x, c of t times f prime of t dt. And that finishes the proof of theorem 421. Now as an immediate application, we prove the following. The sum of 1 over n for n less than equal to x as an estimate log of x plus gamma plus big O of 1 over x, where gamma is a constant known as Euler's constant. So now let's prove this. To prove this, we use the transformation 22.5.2 and put c sub n equal to 1, s sub t equal to 1 over t, and n1 equal to 1. Now by this transformation, what do we get? The left-hand side of this formula becomes simply the sum of one over n for x less than or equal to x. Well, the right hand side of it becomes c of x divided by x because f of x is taken as 1 over x plus n1 is 1 and we integrate from 1 to x of c of t divided by t squared dt. And we continue simplifying this. c of x is equal to the floor of x by our definition. And to evaluate this integral, we're going to separate this uh, flower of t as two parts. And compute this integral, which is equal to log of x. And to compute this part, we're going to rewrite this integral as two parts, one part from 1 to infinity and the other from x to infinity. Because the numerator is bounded by 1, so we can convert an integral. And let's continue and uh, separate this uh, floor of x divided by x again into two parts.
And now you see there are five things in this sum. We're going to regroup them and put together this one and the integral from one to infinity. Know that this part is actually a negative number because flower of t is less than or equal to t. And the other part Now we flip this t and the uh, floor of t and subtract x minus floor of x divided by x. This part because this integral is convergent, is a constant. And that constant will be the Euler's constant, gamma. Because this integral is negative, but at the same time, you can see its absolute value is also bounded by 1, by integrating from 1 to infinity of 1 over t squared. This gamma will turn out to be a constant between 0 and 1. But of course, you don't have to know what kind of value this is, because we only need to accept this as a constant. You don't know how big it is. And this part is something that we want to show to be of order 1 over x. And we will denote this part by e, which stands for error. The absolute value of E is bounded about by now using the triangular inequality. Note that this integrand is bounded above by 1 over t squared. So this part of integral is bounded by the integral from x infinity of 1 over t squared dt. And this guy, the absolute value of this guy, is bounded by 1 over x. And they together, if you compute this integral, is also 1 over x. So they together will be 2 over x. Anyway, this e is big O of 1 over x. And we are done with the proof of theorem 422. In this section, we're going to establish an important sum concerning logarithm. To this end, we're going to first prove the following lemma, which states that if you look at the summation of the h power of log of x divided by n, for n less than or equal to x, the growth rate of this is a big O of x. Here h is a positive number. And now let's prove this. First, let us separate the left hand side into two parts. We will single out the term when n is equal to 1. And we take the sum of the rest. And now we get the upper bound of this guy by an integral. We keep the first term. And for the second term, for each individual summand, we see that it is upper bounded by. 
log of x divided by t to the h power. This is an integration from n minus 1 to n dt. And this inequality falls from the monotonicity of log of x divided by t to the h power. This integrand is monotonically decreasing when t increases. This is because log of x by the n to the h power is less than or equal to log of x by the divided by t to the h power. For t in the interval from n minus 1 to n. And now we can put together these integrals. This will be the integral from 1 to x. And now you see why we have to single out this first term. Because if you don't single it out, this t will start from 0 which is the singularity of this function. Now, in order to give this guy an estimate, we're going to perform a u substitute, as in the first year calculus. With a u equal to x divided by t. Now, when t goes from 1 to x, u will go from x to 1. And by chain rule, the additional factor here will be negative x divided by u squared. Now we simplify this. And we'll majorize this integral to the integral from 1 to infinity. And now, observe that this integral is converted. This is a finite integral. Because logarithm grows slower than any positive power of monomial. So this guy will be bounded by 1 over u to some delta with delta bigger than 1. So by the p-test, you will see that this integral is finite. Now this is from the calculus. And we factor out this x. And for the same reason, you can see this guy grows slower than any positive power of x. So they together will be a big O of x. And with this, we finish the proof of this lemma, namely theorem 423. With this lemma in hand, we prove the following estimate on the summation of lambda of n divided by n for n less than or equal to x. We show that this guy is log of x plus big of y, namely a remainder bounded by a constant. And recall, log of n is equal to log of p if n is the power of p. Otherwise, it is zero. I will write down the definition of it when we use it. To prove this, we first put h equal to 1 in the previous theorem. And it follows that log of x divided n for n less than equal to x is equal to big O of x. This theorem actually tells you the growth rate of this sum is always x independent of the choice of h. And this h might only affect 
the constant in front of this x. And now we rewrite this sum. We can pull out this log of x out, and the rest will just be the summation for all n less than to x of once. So we get the floor of x times log of x. And now, if you move the sum of log of n's to one side, you'll see it grows like x times log of x plus big O of x. Now we make the following claim. To set up a bridge between the sum and lambda of n. We will show that sum is equal to the summation for n less than equal to x of the floor of x over n times lambda of n. And at this point, let me recall the definition for lambda of n. To prove this, we're going to first collapse the sum into a product. And for this factorial, again, we're going to use the rounders formula for the prime factorization of factorials. And now observe that we can drop this floor notation. And now let me explain this. If you look at the Euclidean division for the floor of x, it is equal to p to the m times q plus r with q equal to precisely this floor and r between 0 and p to the m. Now we're going to add x minus floor of x to both sides. What do we get? We'll get x equal to, now the remainder becomes r plus x minus floor of x. But these three terms together is still less than p to the m because x minus floor of x is always strictly less than 1. Therefore, the floor of x divided by p to the m is still equal to q, which is the same as the floor of this guy. And this verifies these two things are equal. And now let's continue. We'll break this product again into the sum. And now as a last step, we make the following important observation. We claim that this sum is precisely the sum we want, the summation over all n of the floor of x over n times lambda of n. Why is this true? This is true simply because of the definition of lambda of n. I said there's nothing other than just the definition. Look, lambda of n is equal to log of p if n is equal to p to the m. And now otherwise, it is zero. Although it looks like this sum has more terms than this sum. But by definition of lambda, 
you will see the actual terms are all equal to zero because whenever n is not a power of p, the individual summit will become zero. And this verifies our claim. Now, to finish the proof of theorem 424, it suffices to connect the right hand side of this claim to the left hand side of theorem 424. So now let's rewrite the right hand side by dropping this floor notation. I will call this part E. And E stands for error here. To give a bound for E, we observe that the, the coefficients are bounded by 1. So this is less than or equal to the summation of lambda of n's is n less than or equal to x. And the sum is precisely equal to plus f x by definition of plus f x. So this is nothing but definition. And plus of x, we know it is a big of x by theorem 440. We proved. And thus, if you move this e to the left hand side, and using this estimate, you will see. And from what we derived above, the summation of log of n for n less than equal to x is equal to what? Is equal to x times log of x plus big O of x. And that big O of x here will merge with this big O of x. So this is equal to x times log of x plus big O of x. And now we divide both sides by x. This yields the result we need for theorem 424. So we are done with the proof. Now as a corollary to theorem 424, let's prove the following. We'll show the summation for all prime p less than or equal to x of log of p divided by p is also log of x plus something bounded by a constant. To prove this, we're going to look at the difference between and and now we'll rewrite the first sum in terms of log of p. Remember we did this before. This is nothing but the definition for lambda of n. Because lambda of n is log of p if n is a power of p. Otherwise, it is zero. So they are equal. And now, what is the difference between these two things? You should be able to see immediately that this sum is precisely the situation when m is equal to 1. So the subtraction of this is just the, the summation of this guy, this sum, when m starts from 2 instead of 1. And now we're going to give an upper bound of this by dropping this x. Namely, we're going to sum up all possibilities. By Fubini's theorem, we switch the sum, and this is just going to be a 
summation for all p's of this geometric series times log of p. By using the formula for the sum of geometric series, this is uh, 1 over p squared divided by 1 minus 1 over p. And from calculus, you can easily see this is a. Therefore, the difference between these two guys is still bounded by a constant. And this difference is also a positive number. This proves theorem 425. Now we are going to connect our theorem 424, the estimate for the summation of lambda of n divided by n for n less than equal to x, to our function psi. And we are going to establish the following estimate for an integral involving psi. This estimate actually deserves a theorem, but unfortunately Hardy didn't consider this as a separate theorem. So in the future, I'm just going to refer to this as 22.6.1. To establish this, again we're going to use elbow summation, or our theorem 421. Specifically, we're going to use the formula 22.5.2 in theorem 421, which says to use this formula, we'll set f of t equal to 1 over t, c sub n equal to lambda of n, c of x as a result will be the summation of lambda of n for n less than equal to x, which is simply psi of x. And the n1 is equal to 2. Actually, c of 1 is equal to lambda 1 which is by definition equal to zero. So these are the setups. As we cover more and more topics, you will realize the importance of this uh, Abel summation in analytic number theory. Because you will see a lot of transformations transforming arithmetic functions to the summation of those arithmetic functions. And this Abel summation provides a perfect bridge in many cases. So now let's continue. Now we have we simply plug in all these specific values for C sub n, f, etc. This is what we get. Now by theorem for 14, we know that the psi of x divided by x is bounded by a constant. And by Theorem for 24 above, we see the summation of lambda of n divided by n for n less than equal to x equal to log of x plus big of 1. And now we're going to plug these two pieces of information back to this equation. And you will immediately see the integration from 2 to x of psi of x divided by t squared dt is equal to 
log of x plus big O of y, which finishes the proof of 22.6.1. You might wonder why we are proving this estimate for this integral of positive t divided by t squared. And in particular, how is this relevant to the prime number theorem? Now let me show you how this could be relevant to the prime number theorem. Indeed, we have the following theorem that looks very much close to the prime number theorem. We we'll show from this formula that the inf of pi of x divided by x divided by log of x is less than or equal to 1. But at the same time, the sup of pi of x divided by x divided by log of x is bigger than or equal to 1. And you might think, because the prime number theorem concerns the limit of this ratio, are we able to obtain the prime number theorem immediately from these two inequalities? Unfortunately, no. We still need to show that the limit exists. As long as the limit of this ratio exists, it must be equal to 1. And that finishes the proof of the prime number theorem. So now let's prove this uh, theorem for 26. We'll prove it by contradiction. We first recall by theorem for 20. We have pi of x similar to theta of x divided by log of x, which is again similar to Psi of x divided by log of x. Therefore, to prove this theorem for 26, it suffices to show the lim inf when x goes to infinity of psi of x divided by x is less than or equal to 1, and lim sup when x goes to infinity of Psi of x divided by x is bigger than 1. It suffices to show these two inequalities. So now how do we prove them? Suppose that the inf as x goes to infinity of Psi of x divided by x is something bigger than 1. For example, it is 1 plus delta. For some, delta bigger than 0. Note that delta must be a finite number because, because we already know that percent of x has the upper bound that is a constant multiple of x when x goes to infinity. So this delta must be a finite number as well. Then, There exists an x naught bigger than zero such that Psi of x is bigger than one plus delta divided by two times x for all x bigger than x naught. This is by the definition of limit. Now let's look at the integral. We're going to split this integral into two parts. And the cutoff is this x0. Now, it is better to make this x0 bigger than 2. So that the first integral is always non-negative. In the second part, you see that when x0 is bigger than 2, which means when t 
here is bigger than 2, this sub x has this lower bound. So, we first throw away the first integral, and we'll lower bound the second integral by what? By this linear thing. Apply to plus f t. But this guy is computable. It's equal to is equal to precisely. And from here, you should be able to see a contradiction. Because on one hand, we just showed that this integral is log of x with coefficient 1 in the front plus big of 1. This is uh, 22.6.1. On one hand, we have this. On the other hand, on the right hand side, you get a coefficient strictly bigger than 1 times log of x. So there's a contradiction as x goes to infinity. Therefore, this contradiction shows that lim inf as x goes to infinity of plus f x divided by x must be bounded by 1. And the similar argument shows that lim sup is bigger or equal to 1. And that finishes the proof of theorem 426. And now you might ask, how far are we away from the final proof of the prime number theorem, from theorem 426? It seems that it suffices to show this limit exists. Because from this theorem, as long as the limit exists, the limit must be equal to 1. You might think we are really close. But I'm afraid not. Because the part that shows the limit exists is a truly technical part. And to that end, we will need Selberg's asymptotic formula together with really hard analysis on the remainder term, by which we mean psi of x minus x. And that is the true difficulty and technicality in proving the prime number theorem. In this section, we're going to introduce a few properties of the Mobius function mu and lambda. And these properties will be very useful in our proof of the Selberg's asymptotic formula. Some audience might be already familiar with these properties, and you can feel free to skip through this section of the video series. Now let's talk about the Mobius function mu. The Mobius function mu is defined as follows. First, mu of 1 is equal to 1. And second, mu of n is equal to 0 if n has a squared factor. And if n does not have a squared factor, meaning n is a product of distinct primes, say they are k distinct primes, then it is defined as negative 1 raised to the power k. Or some people may prefer to write this as mu of n equal to maybe 1 to the power k if n x equal to p1 times p2 all the way to pk with p1 through pk distinct 
primes. And is equal to 1 if n is equal to 1. And 0 otherwise. In which case, there's a non trivial squared factor in n. And now let's talk about a few properties of the Mobius function. Again, we will use the same labeling as in Hardy's book. This property says if you sum up mu of d, where d is the divisor of the integer n, then the sum is equal to 1 if the positive integer n is equal to 1 and 0 if n is bigger than 1. And now let's prove this. The proof is done by using the prime decomposition together with the binomial formula. If n is equal to 1, the sum is really trivial. This is just a mu of 1. And now if n is bigger than 1, then we can write the prime decomposition for n. Say n is equal to the product of p1 to the a1, p2 to the a2, all the way to pk to the ak, with p1 through pk distinct. And now we can calculate this sum. The summation will become, to compute this, we're going to stratify this sum. First, we single out the case when d is equal to 1. And in the second stage, we're going to sum up all those d's, which is equal to one prime factor here. And a mu of p sub i. For p sub i equal to p1, p2, all the way to pk. And next, we're going to sum up all the mu of p sub i times p sub j for all distinct p i and p j here. And we keep going. The first guy, mu of 1, is equal to 1. And the second guy, by definition of the mobile function, this guy is equal to negative 1. And in total, we have summed up k minus a negative ones. So in the next stage, you get k. But uh, there's a negative sign in front of it. And next, it will be k choose 2, because we are considering all possibilities that, because we are considering all choices of PIPJs among P1 through PK. So there will be k choose 2 cases. And this sum will be alternating. Next term will be k choose 3 with a negative 1 in the front because it's a product of three things. And in general, for the rth term, we can get negative 1 to the rth power times k choose r. And the last term will be negative 1 to the k. But what is this? This is precisely equal to, by the binomial formula, 1 minus 1 raised to the power k, which is equal to 0. So here we have used the fact that n is bigger than 1. Otherwise, there's no prime factor in n, and this argument doesn't make sense. So there are indeed two cases when a is equal to 1, the sum is equal to 1. If n is bigger than 1, the sum is 0. Now, among all properties of Mobius function, the Mobius inversion formula 
is especially important. The Mobius inversion formula states as follows. Let f and g be two functions from the set of integers to r. This is called arithmetic functions. Now if g of n is equal to the summation of f d's for d ranges over all divisors of n, then f of n is equal to the summation of all mu of n divided by d times g of d for d divides n. And you can also write this so-called convolution in another way. By summing up all divisors d of mu of d times g of n divided by d. And you can easily see that these two sums are equal. And now let's prove this. We'll start from the right hand side. With this uh, convolution. Now we plug this equation that g of n is equal to f of d, where d ranges over all divisors of n into g of n divided by d. And you will become, now you are treating this n over d as a separate integer. So now we are considering all divisors of n divided by d of f of c, where c ranges over all divisors of n divided by d. And now we're going to merge these two iterated sums into one sum. These two sums together will give us the summation of mu d times f of c where c times d divides it. So here, we are considering all divisors c and d of n, and at the same time, c times d is also a divisor of n. And we sum up mu of d times f of c over all such possibilities. Let us rewrite this sum in a different form. Let us first, for each c divides n, we sum up all mu of these with d divides n over c. And then, we sum up all of f of c times the sum, where c divides n. And you can think of this process as the finite Fubini theorem. But now, what is this part? What is this sum? By our previous theorem, you know the sum is equal to 1 if c is equal to n, and is equal to 0 if c is a divisor that is less than n, meaning n over c is at least 2. Therefore, the only term survives here is the term when c is equal to n, in which case, you get just f of n. And hope this makes sense. And now we connect the Mobius function mu we just defined to lambda. Recall, the lambda is defined as log of p if n 
is a non-trivial power of p, and zero otherwise. Remember, in particular, lambda of one is equal to zero. The first formula we're going to show about lambda is the following. We show that if you sum up lambda of d for d divides n, you will get precisely log of n. And you can easily imagine the reason we want to show this is that we want to connect this to the Mobius inversion formula. So how do we prove this? This is proved by combinatorics, namely by counting. Again, if n is equal to 1, then the statement is trivial, because lambda of 1 is 0, and log of 1 is also 0. Now if n is bigger than 1, then we use a prime decomposition again. In view of this prime decomposition, what is the summation on the left hand side? The summation will become first by definition of lambda. The sum is precisely equal to the summation of log of p, where there is some power of p divides n. More precisely, in view of this prime decomposition, this sum is actually equal to, now for each prime factor of n, we count the multiplicity of that prime factor in n. For example, the multiplicity of p1 is r1, the multiplicity of pk is rk. So in total, we are summing up r1 times log of p1 plus dot dot rk times log of pk. So for this equality, you look at for each piece of i, how many terms are there so that the piece of i raised to the power m divides n. There will be precisely r sub i terms. So writing it more explicitly, p sub i divides n, p sub i squared divides n, all the way to p sub i r i divides n. That is why in front of log of p sub i, you should get r sub i. So if you understand this, you will see immediately this is precisely equal to log of n by the product rule of log functions. So we are done with this proof. And as an immediate corollary to this, here we are still using the same labeling with the hardest book, although this is a 295 and this 296. This is a corollary to 296. As a corollary, let's see why this equality is true. This is true simply because of the Mobius inversion formula, which is the theorem 266, together with 296. Because the log function here plays exactly the same role with the function g here. Log of n is equal to summation of lambda of d where d divides n is same as the condition that g of n is equal to summation of f of d where d divides n. So, by the Mobius inversion formula, you should get f of n 
which corresponds to lambda fun here, the summation of mu of n divided by d times log of d for d divided n. So this is very straightforward from Mobius inversion formula together with this theorem. At the end of this section, let us prove another interesting theorem that looks pretty much similar to this one. We will show that lambda of n is also equal to the negative summation of mu of d times log of d for d divides n. So how to prove this? This equation basically had nothing to do with the Mobius inversion formula. Instead, we're going to just prove this with combinatorics. First, if n is equal to 1, then you still get the trivial equality, because left-hand side will be 0, and right-hand side will also be 0. If n is a single power of p for some prime p. Then, the left hand side is equal to log of p and the right hand side will be equal to, now you consider all divisors to this power p to the mth power. Because mu of d is 0 if d contains a square. So there are only two cases where mu of d is not equal to 0. One case is when d is equal to 1, and the other case is when d is equal to p. But as you know, log of 1 is equal to 0. So, there's only one non-zero term in this sum, which is mu of p times log of p. But what is mu of p? Mu of p, because there's, this is a product of only one prime, so it will be negative 1, and neg negative 1 is equal to positive 1, so you can get log of p, which is equal to the left-hand side. So this verifies the case when n equals to the power of p. Now, if n is not equal to 1 and n is not equal to the power of p, which means by the prime decomposition, n is equal to p1 to the r1, p2 to the r2, pk to the rk, for k at least 2. Then again, let us consider the sum on the right-hand side. Let us ignore that negative sign in the front. Because in this case, we're going to show this sum is equal to 0. Because when n is not the power of p, lambda of n must be 0. So we are supposed to show this is equal to 0. And the trick here is that we are only going to count those non-zero terms in this sum. Since there are a lot of possibilities, we're going to only focus on the following case. First, we only consider the non-zero terms. This already means we are only going to consider the terms where d is square free. And second, you can see we can rewrite the sum as the summation for i equal to 1 to k 
of some coefficient lambda sub i times log of pi. Because each d must be the product of some powers of p sub i. And when you break down that product, you will see the sum will eventually become the summation like this. For each log of p sub i, there is a complicated coefficient in front of it. And our goal is to show that each sub lambda i is equal to zero. And thus finishes the proof. So now how do we show each lambda sub i is equal to zero? In fact, we're going to explicitly compute these lambda sub i's by counting. Lambda sub i, I claim, is equal to, first, if you look at the case when d is precisely equal to this p sub i, then the coefficient in front of that is just mu of p sub i. If you look at the case, when d is a product of p sub i with some p sub j, then in that case, the coefficient in front of it will be the summation for all j not equal to i of mu of p sub i times p sub j. And now the general term looks like mu of p sub i, p sub i1 through p sub i l with i sub 1 through s sub l all distinct and they are contained in the set from 1 through k with i omitted. So summing up all such possibilities and that will be the coefficient in front of log of p sub i where d is the product of l plus 1 things. Hope at this point you can understand what's going on here. Once you understand this part, the rest should be easy. Because you can explicitly compute each of those sums. The first one is just negative one. And the second one is k minus 1, choose 1. The third one is uh, minus k minus 1, choose 2. For the general term here, it will be 91 raised to the power L plus 1 times k minus 1 choose L. And now if you pull out this negative 1 to the front, you will get, now let me rewrite this. Does this look familiar to you? It should be, because this is precisely the binomial expansion of Negative 1 minus 1 raised to power k minus 1. Because k here we assume is at least 2, so this must be always equal to 0. Which is also equal to lambda of n. Because n is not a powerful prime. It is a product of many things. 
So lambda of n is equal to 0. And that finishes the proof. And starting from the next section of the video series, we'll start talking about the famous Selberg's asymptotic formula. In this section, we'll talk about Selberg's asymptotic formula, which plays a key role in the elementary proof of prime number theorem. In Hardy's book, the theorem is labeled as theorem 430, but I believe that is a typo. It should be labeled as theorem 433. There are two formulas in this theorem. The first one states that Cos of x times log of x plus the summation for n less than equal to x of lambda of n times cos of x divided by n is 2x times log of x plus big O of x. And the second formula states that the summation for n less than or equal to x of lambda of n times log of n plus the summation for all positive integers mn whose product is less than or equal to x of lambda of n times lambda of n is equal to the same right hand side 2x times log of x plus big O of x. In the literature, you might have seen Selberg's asymptotic formula stated in other forms. But in this video series, we're going to state this as these two formulas because they will be directly used in our proof of prime number theorem. First, let us prove that these two formulas are actually equivalent. The first observation is that this part is actually equal to this part. Why are they equal? Let's verify this. If you start with this sum and you use the definition for psi of x over n, and you plug in the definition of psi of x over n in terms of lambda, and you merge these two iterate sums, you get precisely the summation over here. And this verifies the second part of the left hand side of the first formula is the same as its counterpart in the second formula. Now, to finish the proof that these two are equivalent, it suffices to show that the difference between the first term on the left hand side of the first formula and the first term in the left hand side of the second formula differ by something that is a big O of x. Once we show this, we are done. So we claim that this sum is equal to this plus of x times log of x plus a big O of x. How do we prove this? Indeed, we're going to use the Abel transformation 22.5.2. And recall, this transformation says 
And we're going to use this formula with c sub n equal to lambda of n. f of t equal to log of t. And since lambda of 1 is equal to 0, we can take n1 to be 2. And it follows from this Abel summation 22.5.2, this formula follows immediately. Under this claim, you can immediately see that these two formulas are actually equivalent. So it suffices for us to just show one of them. In the following, we are going to prove the second one, namely 22.14.3. The formula appearing in this claim is quite important. We will see this again. And from now, we're going to give this a name Call it 22.14.4. Now let's prove this. The proof will be divided into two parts upon introducing an auxiliary summation. We define S of x. as a double sum for each n less than equal to x and for each d divisor of n of mu of d times log of x divided by d squared. And we will show that the left hand side of the Selberg's asymptotic formula, 22.14.3 plus a big O of x is equal to s of x, which is in turn equal to the right-hand side, and thus finish the proof. And now, let us first give the proof for this part. To prove this, we're going to start with the definition for s of x. What we do is that we're going to study first the inner summation for each n less than equal to x. If n is equal to 1, then the summation is equal to simply log of x squared. And if n is bigger than 1, then the sum will be equal to, now let's break up this log of x over d squared. Because when n is bigger than 1, the summation of mu of d for d ranges over all divisors of n is equal to 0. So the first of the three terms is equal to 0. Specifically, this is by the theorem 263 in our previous section. And now we write the second term as negative 2 log x times for d divided by n of mu of d times log of d. And the last term is mu of d times log of d squared. Does this term look familiar to you? This guy also appears in our previous section of the video series. Actually, this is the theorem 
298. The theorem 298, this guy, is actually equal to negative lambda fin. And there's also a negative sign in the front. So in total, the second term becomes positive twice log of x times lambda of n. So that is the second term. And we'll keep the third term as it is. Therefore, s of x can be simplified as log of x squared plus the summation for n less than equal to s but bigger or equal to 2 of this guy. And now we take this sum and simplify this a little bit more. And you might have seen immediately that this sum is precisely to psi of x. Notice that lambda 1 is equal to 0. To finish the proof of this part, we need to establish a very important identity. We'll show the summation of lambda of h times lambda of k for hk equal to n is equal to log of n times lambda of n plus the summation of mu of d log of d squared for d divides n. We we'll prove this identity. The proof is by playing with the sum together with formulas in elementary number theory we introduced in the previous section. First, we're going to rewrite this sum as the summation of lambda of h times lambda of n divided h for all divisors h of n. And now, we can use theorem 298 to this part. We we'll change this guy to a summation of mu and log. Now don't forget this uh, negative sign in the front. So here we used theorem 298 which we introduced in the previous video section. And next, we're going to flip these two sums. The outer sum will be over all divisors t of n. And the inner sum will be over all h, which are divisors of n divided by d. You can think of this as a Fubini type theorem. And now we see a divisor sum of lambda of h. And this reminds us of another theorem in the previous section, which says this sum is actually a log. And this is by theorem 296 from the previous section. Now let's continue. We'll break this log and thus break the sum into two parts. And you can notice that in the first part, we're going to use theorem 298. So by 298 again, this part is log of n times lambda of n. 
and we will leave the second part alone. Which verifies this, this claim. In Hardest book, this equation has a name 22.14.7. So now we can use this claim into the sum by replacing this part with the difference of this guy and this guy. So by the claim, we rewrite this part as And now we merge these two iterated sums. And at this point, we are very close to the end of the proof that this S of x is the left hand side of this plus some big O of x. To finish the proof, it suffices for us to Recall another thing we just proved. Recall the formula 22.14.4, which states that the sum here differs from the product here by a big O of x. And if we multiply both sides by 2, We get this equation, and because twice of big O of x still big O of x, we can remove 2 here. And now, if we plug this guy into here and cancel out this uh, twice of log of x plus f of x, we'll get what? And because this log of x squared is also big O of x, so we can merge this guy into here, and we do a cancellation from here. Eventually, we're going to get... And this part is precisely the left-hand side of the Selberg's asymptotical formula 22.14.3. So we are done with the first part of the proof of the Selberg's asymptotic formula. Now, it remains for us to show that S of x is equal to the right-hand side of the Selberg's asymptotic formula, namely 2x times log of x plus big O of x. So now let's prove this. Before we start the proof, let me recall theorem 422, which we proved in the section Abelk summation formula. The so proof that s of x is equal to 2x log of x plus big of x is tricky. It is tricky from the beginning. We will start with the subtraction s of x minus gamma squared, where this gamma is this Euler's constant from theorem 422. Now let's plug in the definition for s of x. What about this gamma squared? We will first write this as and here, this double sum is actually equal to 1 because the divisor sum of mu of d for d divides n is equal to 1 if n is equal to 1 and 0 otherwise. 
And this is due to theorem 263. Now we combine these two. And we perform a change of variable for this double sum. We change this to And for those who don't see this immediately, let me provide some explanations. To explain that this double sum is same as this double sum, you simply have to notice that there is a 1 1 correspondence between set of the pairs d, n with d divides n and n less than equal to x. And the set of pairs d comma k with d less than or equal to x and k less than or equal to x divided by d. And this is a one one correspondence given by if you have a d comma n on the left hand side, you map it to d comma n divided by d. And if you have a d comma k on the right hand side, you map it back to d comma k times d. And you will see that these two maps are inverses to each other, establishing a 1 1 correspondence between these two sets. And now, let's continue. You may observe that this k is a vacuous variable in this summation, meaning it is just counting how many terms are there in this inner sum. How many terms? They are precisely the floor of x divided by d many terms. So. You can simplify this to a single sum. And now we do our usual trick of removing the floor outside of x by d. We will write this guy as x divided by d floor minus x divided by d plus x divided by d. I will split this into two parts. And as before, call this the error term. I will first bound this error term. By matrization, we see that the absolute value of the individual summand is bounded by first this part is bounded by 1 and mu of d is also bounded by 1 and this difference is bounded by the sum of them. So we get the sum which is equal to big O of x. Why is this guy equal to big of x. This is by the theorem 423 in the section an important sum. In that section, we show that this sum is a big of x. Back then, this 2 could be any positive number. And for the other part, the summation of gamma squared for d less equal to x is simply another big O of x. So this error is bounded by big O of x. Now, we remain to study the first part. We will show that this guy is 2x log of x plus big O of x. Or, Equivalently, 
if you divide both sides by x. So now let's prove this. We'll start by simplifying the left hand side. And now let's look at this factor. By all this theorem, a theorem for 22, we see that this guy can be replaced by the harmonic sum 1 over k for k less than or equal to x divided by d plus the remainder term big O of d divided by x. Namely the reciprocal of this. And we'll simply copy down the rest. And again, we're going to separate this sum into two parts. One part is this, plus the other part will turn out to be our error term. And again, we denote this by e. Let us first bound this e. What we do is that for the individual segment, mu of d is bounded by 1. And this difference is bounded by its sum, namely log of x divided by d plus gamma. And we will keep big O of d divided by x. Now, this one over d cancel with the d here. And when you sum up this part, for d less equal to x, what do you get? Again, by using theorem 423, you get big of x. This is from the section, an important sum. And eventually you get big of what? So this e is bounded by a constant. And now let's study the first term. Let us simplify this. The first thing we do is that we're going to merge these two iterated sums. We'll merge them into the summation for all d times k less equal to x. And we'll combine this mu of d divided by d and 1 over k. And next, we're going to do a change of variable. Let n equal to d times k. You will see we can again break this sum into an iterate one. If the audience want a more rigorous explanation, you can again establish the 1 1 correspondence between this sum and this sum. There's a 1 1 correspondence between the pair d, k and d, n here. And now let's continue. Let us pull this 1 over n outside of this inner sum. And simplify this a bit. What we do is that we will rewrite this as log of x minus log of d. And we will group log of x minus gamma together. And the second part is the divisor sum of mu of d times log of d. 
No, this guy. By theorem 298 is equal to. Here I have to make sure to include this negative sign. Together with the negative sign, this is equal to lambda of n. So now let's us uh, take the summation. You see this part the sum of lambda of n divided by n for n less than to x. Which by theorem 424 is equal to log of x plus big of 1. Now, what about the first part? If you look at this sum, this inner sum, you will see this is a perfect setting under the theorem 263. By 263, this divisor sum is equal to 1 if n is equal to 1, and it is equal to 0 if n is bigger than 1. So the sum will simply become log of x minus gamma. Because only the term when n is equal to 1 will survive. So, in the end, the whole thing will be simplified to twice of log of x plus a big O of 1, since this gamma is a constant. So, we merge this into big O of 1. And this, we will plug this back to here, you will see it becomes 2 times x times log of x plus big of x. And together with this, we obtain that s of x minus gamma squared is equal to 2x log of x plus big of x. But gamma squared here is a constant, which means we have verified this. And this finishes the proof of the second part that s of x is equal to the right-hand side of the Selberg's asymptotic formula. And we are done with the proof of the Selberg's asymptotic formula. Starting from this section, we will finally begin to prove the prime number theorem with the help of the Selberg's asymptotic formula. Now we have proved Selberg's asymptotic formula, and we want to use it to prove the prime number theorem. Here is our plan. Recall from theorem 420, which says, pi of x, the number of primes less than equal to x, is similar to theta of x divided by log of x, similar to psi of x divided by log of x. Now, in order to prove the prime number theorem, Namely, pi of x is similar to x divided by log of x. It suffices to show that psi of x is similar to x. Or, more formally, by the definition of this symbol, this means the limit of psi of x divided by x as x goes to infinity is equal to 1. Now we define a function v of x as psi of e to the x 
divided by e to the x minus 1. And now it suffice to show the limit of v of x as x goes to infinity is equal to 0. Or let alpha be equal to the limb soup of v of x as x goes to infinity. It suffices to show that alpha is equal to 0. And now you may ask, what role of the Selberg's asymptotic formula will play here? The role of the Selberg's asymptotic formula here is that it will provide some integral inequalities for us. And now let me explain. First, Selberg's asymptotic formula implies the following integral inequality that the absolute value of v of x times x squared is less than or equal to this double integral plus v of x. And we will use this integral inequality to show that the alpha which is the limb soup of v of x is less than or equal to the limb soup of this average, which later will denote by beta. And second, we'll prove by contradiction by assuming that alpha is bigger than zero. Suppose alpha is bigger than zero. And we will find a contradiction that shows alpha is bigger than beta. And the way to achieve this is another clever application of Selberg's asymptotic formula. We will show that Selberg's asymptotic formula will give us that the average is less than alpha prime plus little o of 1 with sum alpha prime less than alpha and taking lim soup in this inequality will give us beta less than equal to alpha prime which is less than alpha which is a contradiction and the source of this contradiction is that alpha is bigger than zero so this contradiction will force alpha equal to zero and thus finish the proof of the prime number theorem Now we'll start the details of this elementary proof of prime number theorem. We'll begin with introducing two auxiliary functions. First, recall the theorem for 20. Pi of x is similar to theta of x divided by log of x, similar to Psi of x divided by log of x. Now to prove theorem 6, namely the prime number theorem, it suffices to prove the following theorem for 34. The psi of x is similar to x. And to this end, we put Poisson of x equal to x plus r of x. 
then it follows that plus f x similar to x is equivalent to saying that r of x is a little o of x as x goes to infinity. And next, we're going to use Selberg's asymptotic formula. The first thing we do with the Selberg's asymptotic formula is that we are going to replace Poisson of x in that formula with r of x. Now recall theorem 424 which is about the summation of lambda of n divided by n for n likes to go x equal to log of x plus b equal to y. We prove this in the section an important sum. Record this and theorem 433, Selberg's asymptotic formula. This is theorem 430 in Hardest book, but I believe that is a typo. Specifically, we recall the first formula there. There are two formulas for Selberg's asymptotic formula. Here we are using the first one. And now we replace plus f x with x plus r of x. Now, using theorem 424, we can make a big simplification to this Selberg's asymptotic formula with plus f x replaced by r. First, this term can be rewritten as and by theorem for 24, we can see this term is equal to x times log of x plus b go of x. Now, you see a beautiful cancellation of 2x times log of x from both sides. And this big of x will merge with this big of x. Therefore, we get a rather simplified Selberg's asymptotic formula from here. And there is a label to this in Hardest book. This is an equation. 22.15.1 From now, we'll use this simplified Selberg's asymptotic formula to prove a couple of formulas consecutively. The first formula we're going to prove is the following. We show the absolute value of r of x times log of x squared is less than or equal to, and the coefficient here is. At this point, please recall that the summation of a n is precisely the left hand side of the second Selberg's asymptotic formula. So this is the first formula we're going to prove. The second formula we're going to prove is something that you will replace this part on the right hand side by an integral. And there will be more formulas following these two. But we will start by proving 22.15.2. This simplified 
Selberg's asymptotic formula. And we shall replace this x by x over m. And now we take the following subtraction. We multiply log of x to the left hand side of this equation minus the summation for m less than equal to x of lambda of m times the left hand side of this equation. On one hand, this difference will become, which simplifies this to, now here, again we are using theorem 424. By theorem 424, this guy becomes, now you pull this x to the front. And this gives you a perfect shape of applying theorem 424. And combining this will give us still big O of x log of x. And on the other hand, we can also simplify this directly. So how is this simplified? We're just going to distribute these brackets. Note that this sum is indexed by n. But now we will change this n to m for convenience. Which cancels with this guy. Up to a factor of log of m in each individual summand. Now combining this guy with this, we conclude this new identity. And now we do the following. We first change the variable here from m back to n, and we will change the sum here into a graded sum, or stratified sum. So we first change the variable from m to n here, and we will change the sum here in the following way. For each n less than to x, we look at all hk, equal to n, and we take the sum of all of lambda of k, lambda of h, r of x divided by n. So this guy is the same as above, equal to big O of x times log of x. And now we move these two parts to the right hand side and we use the triangle inequality. We get the absolute value of r of x times log of x squared bounded by this sum with x value on each segment plus this sum plus the last term is big O of x times log of x. And now let's merge these two together.
from here, you realize that is a coefficient in front of the absolute value of r of x divided by n is precisely a sub n. By definition, this is a sub n. And with this, we have proved the equation 22.15.2 Now we'll prove 22.15.3 This formula will replace the right hand side of the first formula 22.15.2 by an integral To prove this, we take the difference between this guy and this guy The trick is that we're going to split this difference into two parts. By adding and subtracting a sum, which can be seen as an approximation to this integral. And now you see there are two parts. Our next goal is to show that both of these parts are big O of x log of x. This is what we are going to prove next. For the first part, we are going to use the first formula in theorem 421, above summation, namely the equation 22.5.1, with c1 equal to 0, cn equal to an minus the integral from and minus 1 to n of log of t dt times 2. And f of n equal to the absolute value of r of x over n. And now let's look at left hand side and right hand side of this formula. 22.5.1 The left hand side will become simply by plugging in the definition for c sub i and f of n into this sum and the right hand side will become And now let's figure out what c of x is. c of x, by definition, is a summation of c sub n for n less than or equal to x. Because c1 is 0, this is a summation from equal to 2 to the floor of x. And now let's plug in the definition. Here we have merged all of this integral into one integral, namely from 1 to floor of x. You can see the correspondence. But this integral is computable. There is the antiderivative t times log of t minus t. So we use the newton leibniz formula. Now, what happens if you try to remove the bracket from this part? After removing the bracket, 
I claim it becomes minus 2x log of x plus big O of x. Do you think you can verify this by yourself? You can pause this video and try to work it on your own, but I will give the answer anyway. To verify this, we simply take the subtraction x times log of x minus x floor times log of x floor. We can first majorize this guy by monotonicity to floor of x plus 1 times log of floor of x plus 1. And now we can compute this. As x goes to infinity, you can see that these two parts together is little o of x. If you divide both sides by x, you see this part divided by x will go to 0. This part alone will go to 0 as x goes to infinity, and this part is bounded by 1 after dividing by x. So they together will be a little of x. But this part here is a big O of x. So they together is minus 2x log of x plus big O of x. So we verified this part. Now, what is the summation of a n for n less than equal to x? What about this part? Do you remember? By definition of a sub n together with the Selberg's asymptotic formula 22.14.3, the summation is 2x log of x plus big O of x. So now let's plug this guy back to the last line of this equation. What do we get? Now this term here is 2x log of x plus big O of x by Selberg asymptotic formula 22.14.3. Now we can cancel this 2x log of x with 2x log of x. So the together will be a big O of x. Now we plug c of x equal to big O of x back to the right hand side. The c of n will become big O of n. For the sum, we take everything into big O notation. However, the function in the parentheses of big O must be a non-negative function. So we are not supposed to use the parentheses, but absolute value here. Namely, the sum is equal to big O of this sum as a function of x. And second part is a big O of x. For those who cannot see this immediately, let me remind you the definition for r. Because plus of x is big O of x, so r of x is also a big O of x. Here I'm talking about theorem 114. So, because x divided by floor of x as x goes to infinity is a bounded number, so r of x is bounded. Therefore, this product is still a big O of x. However, at this point, we don't know how to deal with this part. 
This part looks complicated, and for the moment, we don't know how to simplify it. What I do is I'm going to leave a question mark here. We'll address this later, because the similar issue will appear again for the second part. So far, we are working on the first part. To summarize, we have proved that the first part, which is equal to the left-hand side of our summation under these assumptions, is equal to the right-hand side of our summation, which we just simplified as this complicated term plus big of x. Later, we'll prove the thing with a question mark is equal to big O of x times log of x. So the first part is big O of x times log of x. But now let's leave this alone and look at the other part. Let us simplify this part. The simplification for this part is relatively straightforward. First, Let's put an absolute value outside of the whole thing. And we split this integral so that it aligns with the upper limit of this sum. Namely, we do a truncation at the floor of x. This is the truncation I meant. And now, we use a triangular inequality to throw this guy outside of the absolute value sign. And for the first part, look at this integral. We're going to break this integral into a sum so that it aligns with this sum here. And next, we're going to merge these two sums of integrals and apply the absolute value inequality for integrals. This guy is less than or equal to the summation for n bigger or equal to 2 less than or equal to x and integral from n minus 1 to n of this absolute value. So that is the first part. We'll leave this alone and look at the second part. What about this? This guy can easily be bounded because the upper limit minus the lower limit for this integral is bounded by 1 log of t is less than or equal to log of x. And r of x divided by t, by definition, this is psi of x divided by t minus x divided by t. And this is a big O of x divided by t by theorem for 14. Because psi of x is big O of x. So, this absolute value for t between floor of x to x is a bounded number. So, big of 1 for t between floor of x and x. So, this integral in total will be bounded by 2 times the difference of the limits bounded by 1 times this guy is a big O of 1 
for t between these two limits, and log of t is bounded by, by log of x. And the together is a big O of log of x. So again, as in our treatment of the first part, we are left with a complicated term involving R. And I will leave a question mark here. As before, we want to show this guy is equal to big O of x times log of x. Now, to understand these two complicated terms better, we shall study for t bigger than t prime because of zero, the relation between the absolute value of rt and the absolute value of rt prime. By triangle inequality, we know their difference is bounded by rt minus rt prime absolute value. Now we plug the definition for r back to here. It is a positive t minus t and same for the t prime part. Now, by triangle inequality, this is bounded by by our assumption t is always bigger than t prime. So this part is always positive. And by the monotonicity of psi, this part is also non-negative. So we have, by dropping the absolute value sign, if you regroup these four terms, we get this. Therefore, if we define this sum, psi of t plus t as a function f of t. Remember, psi of t minus t is r of t, and psi of t is defined as psi of t plus t. It turns out this difference is bounded by f of t minus f of t prime. And this difference, the first observation is that it must be a big O of t. Because f is a big O of t, which follows from the fact that the psi of t is big O of t by theorem 440, which we have used many, many times. Now, in view of this thing, we will study the following sum involving f. The summation for n less than or equal to x minus 1 of n times f of x divided by n minus f of x divided by n plus 1. On one hand, by monotonicity of f, this is always big O equal to zero. Here, x is always a positive number, and actually we always assume it is a big O equal to two. And now, let us give this an upper bound. So, each individual summand is non-negative. So the sum must be non-negative. And now let's give an upper bound for this. To do this, we'll try to create a telescoping sum in here. And we split this. Because the first part is telescoping, most of terms 
will be cancelled out except for the first and the last. The first term, namely when n is equal to 1, is simply f of x. And the last term, namely when n is the floor of x minus 1, this is floor of x times f of x divided by floor of x. And we can merge this term and this term together. Because here, n starts from 1. But that is f of x divided by 2. If we merge these two together, what do we get? We get sum from n equal to 1 less than equal to x of f of x divided by n. So this term comes from this part together with this part. And now, we're going to simply throw away this non-negative term. This is always non-negative. So, whole thing will be bounded by just the first term. But, by theorem for 14, this is what? The summation for n less equal to x of big O of x divided by n. And now you move this summation into the parentheses. You become big O for n less than equal to x of x divided by n. And this guy, by order theorem, if you pull out this x, what is the summation of 1 over n for n less than equal to x? By order theorem, then the theorem for 22, this is big O of x times log of x. So, we have an estimate of this as big O of x log of x. And that is precisely what we need. Now we move back to the first part, the first question mark. Now this guy, remember this absolute value from our derivation above is bounded by the sum in terms of f. Actually here, I don't need to use the less than or equal sign because big O already means upper bound. So I can safely use just the equal sign. And by what we just proved, the sum is big O of x times log of x. And this is precisely what we need. So we have addressed this part. Now what about this part? For the second part, we essentially do the same. First, we will replace R by F. And then, we look at the integrand. By monotonicity, because t is from n minus 1 to n, this integrand is bounded above by, now we replace this t here by the smallest one, namely n minus 1 and replace t here by the largest one. It follows that this integration becomes vacuous, so we can remove the integral. And also observe by the monotonicity for f, we can also drop this absolute value sign. And now, because log of n 
is always less than or equal to n minus 1 for n bigger or equal to 2. You can prove this by calculus. And therefore, we obtain another sum where this estimate applies perfectly. You simply replace n here by n minus 1. In this setting, you will see that this guy is again a big O of x times log of x. And this verifies this the second part. So, we have proved that both this and this are of order big O of x times log of x. But the together is precisely this difference. And this finishes the proof of 22.15.3. Now we combine 22.15.2 and 22.15.3 by plugging this guy into here. We get the absolute value of r of x times log of x squared is bounded by twice of this integral plus b go of x times log of x. Our next job is to simplify the right hand side by introducing a new function. This function will be denoted by v. This v will be the same v as in our plan of the proof of prime number theorem, introduced at the beginning. This guy is defined as r of e to the c divided by e to the c, which, if you read back to the original definition, is Poseidon of e to the c divided by e to the c minus 1. Or if you want to write one step further, because Poseidon was defined as the sum of lambdas. This is a uh, the sum for n less than equal to e to the, the summation of lambda of n. And now, let us plug this new definition back to here and use a change of variable. We'll do the following substitutions. We take x equal to e to the psi and t equal to x times e to the negative eta, which, if you plug x equal to e to the psi to here, this is e to the psi minus eta. How is this substitution reflected in the integral? For the limit, when t goes from 1 to x, eta will go from psi to 0. Because when t is equal to 1, that happens when eta is equal to psi. When t is equal to x, that happens when eta is equal to 0. Now with these substitutions, the integral will become So the limits will be from psi to 0. From here, 
x divided by t will be e to the positive eta. And log of t, if you take the log of both sides, will be psi minus eta. dt will be x times d e to the negative eta, which is x e to the negative eta d eta. But there's a negative sign in the front. And now we reorganize them. By our new notation, this ratio is precisely v of eta. So this is the integral we obtained. And now we perform the following trick. We replace this c minus eta by an integral. The integral from eta to psi of the constant function 1, d, now let's introduce a new variable, zeta. This transforms this integral into a double integral. And the integrand is a function that only depends on variable eta. And as a natural next step, we're going to use a Fubini theorem here to swap d psi and d eta, namely to change the order of integration. When we swap them, the integral we will get is To explain this part, we can draw a picture. Our domain of integration is this triangle. And I mark psi here. In the inner integral of the first double integral, this zeta moves from eta to psi. And in the outer integral, this eta moves from 0 to psi. But when you swap them, this eta will first go from 0 to zeta. And the variable zeta in the outer integral goes from 0 to psi. So this is how the Fubini theorem applied in this setting. Now let's continue. Remember this x by our substitution is actually e to the psi. So we write it back. With this, we finish the change variable for this integration. And the left hand side is actually easier. If you make the substitute x equal to e to the psi, then left hand side, which is the absolute value of r of x times log of x squared, is equal to absolute value of r of e to the psi times psi squared. Therefore, this inequality becomes so that the remainder term big of x times log of x upon this substitution, it will be big O of e to the psi times psi. And now, we divide both sides by e to the psi. And know that r of e to the psi divided by e to the psi is v of psi. So
we get the following integral inequality and call it 22.15.9 now from the definition of v together with theorem for 14 this thing is actually bounded namely big of 1 now we put alpha be the limb soup of the absolute value of v of kc as kc goes to infinity and then this number is a finite number and if we put beta to be the average and take the limb soup as kc goes to infinity but the mean value theorem for integrals is also bounded. But the definition for limb soup, we must have the absolute value of with eta bounded by alpha times some little of one. Where this little of one means a quantity that goes to zero as psi goes to infinity. And this integral from zero to psi of v of eta, d eta, will be bounded by beta times psi plus little o of psi. We have these two relations simply by the definition for limb soup. Now, if we plug this back to here, and note that this zeta will play the role of cosine here. If you plug this back to here, we will get the absolute value of v of psi times psi squared less than equal to twice the integral from 0 to psi and the inner thing will be replaced by beta times zeta plus little of zeta d zeta which upon integration is beta times psi squared because the antiderivative of psi is psi squared divided by 2 so together you get beta times psi squared and the remainder is little of psi squared as psi goes to infinity so if you divide both sides by psi squared, v of psi absolute value will be bounded by beta plus little of 1. Now take lim soup as psi goes to infinity, the left hand side will become alpha, or alpha is this lim soup. So, alpha is less than or equal to beta. This means the limb soup of the absolute value of this uh, v of psi is always less than or equal to the limb soup of its average. Later, we will show that if alpha, remember, to prove the prime number theorem, it suffices to show that alpha is equal to zero. Alpha, named the limb soup here, is equal to zero. Then we are done, because then we will show that psi of x is similar to x. That is equivalent to the prime number theorem. Once we show alpha equal to zero, we are done. 
Later, we're going to assume by contradiction that the alpha is not zero, namely alpha is bigger than zero. And we'll conclude that the alpha is bigger than beta, contradicting to this conclusion here. That is the plan to finish the proof of the prime number zero. As you can see from the previous video section, the proof of the prime number theorem involves a comprehensive understanding of this function v as well as its average we just defined. So to finish our elementary proof of the prime number theorem, we need two lemmas to bound the integrals involving v. The first lemma says that if you integrate the function v over any interval, you get a uniform bound. Specifically, there exists a fixed positive number a1, such that for every positive number c1 and c2, we have this integral is uniformly bounded by this constant a1, independent of the choice of c1 and c2. Note that here, the absolute value is on the integral, not on the function. We can also put this theorem in another way. Just say the supremum for all c1 and c2 bigger than 0 of the integral absolute value is finite. This is our first lemma. Now let's prove this. We first write the integral from c1 to c2 v eta d eta as a difference the integral from 0 to c2 and the integral from 0 to c1. Now, by the triangular inequality, to show that this guy is bounded by an absolute constant, it suffices to show these two are bounded by absolute constant, respectively. And now, we use the definition for v. And perform a change of variable here. We let t equal to e to the eta, and therefore, eta is equal to log of t. If you plug this back to the integral, what do we get? Eta moves from 0 to c. So t moves from 1 to e to the c. Now why is this guy uniformly bounded? Let me write one more step, and then you will see. We'll do a truncation at 2. And if you still don't see at this point, let me do one more step. From here, first, observe that the first integral is from 1 to 2, and the integrand is bounded. The third integral can be computed. 
this is equal to log of e to the psi minus log of 2. What is really interesting is this middle term. This guy is something that we have seen before. Specifically, this is the equation 22.6.1. And previously, we have shown that this integral is log of e to the c plus big O of 1. Therefore, log of e to the c cancels with log of e to the c. And we are only left with absolute constants. This is an absolute constant, this is an absolute constant, and this is an absolute constant. And we are done with the proof of this lemma. And here, the reason that we chose this uh, two truncation is just that we want to use 22.6.1 more precisely. And strictly speaking, you don't really have to pick this truncation. It is from 1 to e to the c. This 22.6.1 should also work. The second lemma we want to establish is the following. First, recall the definition for alpha. Now, if it not is positive and is the root of the function v, then we have the integral from 0 to alpha of the function v of it naught plus tau d tau and here is the absolute value inside and by translation this integral is equal to the integral from it naught to it naught plus alpha of v of tau d tau absolute value inside. This part is just by change of variable. The conclusion of this lemma says this integral is bounded by one half times of squared plus big O of it not inverse. In the proof you will see you may replace this alpha by something else. But then you have to change this big O of it not inverse to something else. Later, we're just gonna use this lemma for the integral from 0 to alpha. And that is why we state it in this way. The proof of this lemma is more involved than it looks. Actually, it involves the Selberg's asymptotic formula. Specifically, we're going to use 22.14.2, which says as follows. Now, we're going to rewrite this formula by replacing this part by something else. By the definition of psi, we know the sum is equal to and if you combine this into one sum, this is what we get. And you have seen this argument before. When we prove that this formula is equivalent to the other one in Selberg's theorem. So now we're going to use this formula. 
Now, for x naught, we go equal to 1, let's say x. We substitute this x by x naught. And we subtract both sides of this equation by both sides of this equation with x naught replacing x. Because x naught is less than x, we can merge these two big O's together as big O of x. And now observe that Poseidon of x and log of x are both monotonically increasing and they are non negative. And this part is always non negative. So we have the following relation. Since Poseidon log are both monotonically increasing and lambda is non-negative. We obtain this inequality. Now let's continue from here to see what this guy can give us. We consider the following difference. We look at the r of x, log of x, minus r of x naught, log of x naught. By definition of r, what is this? This is equal to Poseidon of x minus x times log of x minus Poseidon of x naught minus x naught times log of x naught. And if you break the parentheses, we can use this result above, which says this part is bounded by this thing. So if you plug this into here, we get the upper bound. which simplifies it to on the other hand if we simply look at that Poseidon of x times log of x minus Poseidon of x naught times x naught be going to zero from here and if we replace Poseidon of x by r of x plus x and similarly for Poseidon of x naught, we'll get. And if we move the terms here that don't involve r to the left hand side, what do we get? We will get a lower bound for this difference. And now combine this upper bound with this lower bound. We have the absolute value of the difference r of x log of x minus r of x naught log of x naught. This absolute value less than or equal to the difference x log of x minus x naught log of x naught. This guy is always positive because of our assumption. Plus big O of x resulting from here. Remember, our goal is to establish an upper bound for the integral involving v. But so far in the proof, the letter v 
has not a period. But that is what we're gonna do next. We'll do substitutions on the variable x and x0, and then you will see v appearing. So now put x0 equal to e to the eta0, where eta is positive and is the root of v, as in the hypothesis of this theorem. And it follows that r of x0 is equal to r of e to the it naught, which is by the definition of v, e to the it naught times v of it naught, which is 0. And put x equal to e to the it naught plus tau with tau bigger equal to zero. Then r of x is equal to r of e to the it naught plus tau, and we pull out this exponential, and the remaining part will be v of a naught plus tau. This is simply the definition for v. And at the same time, log of x is equal to a naught plus tau. Now, the left hand side will become what? The left hand side of this inequality will become because now r of x0 is equal to 0. So there's only one term for this absolute value. That is at naught plus tau times e to the at naught plus tau times the absolute value of v of at naught plus tau. And the right hand side of this becomes e to the it naught plus tau times it naught plus tau minus e to the it naught times it naught plus big O of e to the it naught plus tau simply by substitution. So, this inequality will become if we divide both sides by this part, a naught plus tau times e to the a naught plus tau, we will get an upper bound for the function, the absolute value of v of a naught plus tau. This is bounded bar by 1 minus e to the negative tau at naught divided by at naught plus tau plus big O of 1 over at naught plus tau. And now let's rewrite this by separating the variable tau and eta. Now let's focus on these two terms. First, it's easy to see that this part is a big O of 1 over 8 naught. This is simply because this 1 over 8 naught plus tau is bounded by 1 over 8 naught, since tau is non-negative. Now what about this part? I claim this part is also a big O of 1 over a naught. And let's simply check this by definition. 
To check this, we divide this term by 1 over 8 naught, which means we multiply this guy by 8 naught. This is a positive thing. And it is upper bounded by, we can throw away this denominator and become tau times 8 naught divided by 8 naught, which is tau. So this is upper bounded by e to the negative tau times tau. But this thing is always bounded by 1, which verifies this claim. Therefore, we have the value of v of a naught plus tau is bounded by 1 minus e to the negative tau plus big O of 1 over a naught. By calculus, we know this term is always less than or equal to tau. So now we get a really simple upper bound estimate for v of a naught plus tau. Given that a naught is a positive root of v. Now we can finish the proof of this lemma. Using this upper bound, using antiderivative, this is r squared divided by 2, plus for the other term, it is big O of alpha divided by a naught. But alpha is an absolute constant. So we can remove the alpha from here. This is simply r squared divided by 2 plus big O of 1 over a naught. And that finishes the proof of this lemma. And for the proof, we can also see if alpha is not this specific number, then this integral will be alpha squared divided by 2 plus big O of alpha divided by a naught. But later, we are just going to use this with this particular alpha, as stated in Hardest book. Finally, we are close to the end of the proof of the prime number theorem. Based on our previous reduction and new notations, now it suffices to show that alpha is equal to zero. I copied the definitions for alpha and beta as well as two lemmas we just proved concerning the integrals of the function v. And at this point, you may not remember the definition for v, but I will recall this definition when we use it. So don't worry. You might want to pause here and take a screenshot. But I will move on. As I mentioned from the beginning, our proof will be by contradiction. Now we assume alpha is bigger than zero. Then we will show the following. We will show for some choice of delta bigger than alpha and alpha prime less than alpha, we have the following estimate of the integral from zeta to zeta plus delta of the absolute value of the function v with variable eta d eta less than or equal to alpha prime times delta plus little of y as zeta goes to infinity. And we will use this to conclude that the integral from 0 to psi of the absolute value of v of eta d eta is less than or equal to alpha prime times psi plus little o of psi. 
And from here, we will conclude that beta, which is defined as lim soup of the average as psi goes infinity, is less than or equal to alpha prime, which is less than alpha. So this is our basic plan in this final section. And of course, the tricky part is how to pick this delta and alpha prime. And now, let me give away one spoiler. I will tell you what this delta we're going to choose. We will eventually choose delta as the following quantity. 3 alpha squared plus 4a1 divided by 2 alpha. And you can easily see that this number is bigger than alpha, where a1 is a positive constant as in theorem 435, which is the uniform bound for all such integrals. This a1 is an absolute constant. But the reason for this choice will be only fully revealed in the end. From the beginning, you can just assume there is some delta bigger than alpha, ignoring its specific definition. Our first goal is to prove this inequality. And to this end, we need to understand this integral. So to understand the integral, we need to understand the behavior of the function v of eta on an interval. Now at this point, let me recall the definition for v of eta. By definition, v of eta is psi of e to the eta divided by e to the eta minus 1. And psi of e to the eta is defined as the summation of lambda of n for n less than or equal to e to the eta. And recall, this lambda of n is equal to log of p if n is a non-trivial power of p. Otherwise, it is zero. Now let's see the monotonicity of the function v of eta. To this end, let us first study the monotonicity of the function psi. Psi of x is a monotonically increasing step function. And you might want to draw a graph of it. It is locally constant and monotonically increasing, with jumps whenever x hits a power of prime. Now, what about the monotonicity of the function v of eta? By looking at the expression of this function, you can easily see that as eta grows continuously, the denominator will grow continuously. But the numerator is a locally constant function with jumps whenever this e to the eta hits a power prime. So to summarize, v of eta is the monotonically decreasing, except for the points where psi of e to the eta makes jumps. And let me try to draw a very inaccurate picture, so that only gives an idea of uh, this behavior. 
By no means, this picture is an accurate figure. The graph of the function v of eta looks like this. For the most of the time, it is a monotonically decreasing until e to the eta is a point that is the power of prime. Then it will make a jump and starts decreasing again until e to the eta meets another power of prime. Make a jump and starts decreasing again and so on. So this is the behavior of V of eta. Now, for any zeta greater than zero, over the interval from zeta to zeta plus delta minus alpha, there are only two cases for a function V of eta. Case 1 is that for this zeta bigger than 0, there exists a knot in the interval from zeta to zeta plus delta minus alpha. Note that it knot depends on zeta such that v of it naught is zero. And here, let me make a remark that eta naught may not be the only zero. The sum zero of the function v. And this is the first case. The second case is the following. If, on the other hand, for this zeta bigger than zero, v of eta is non-zero for all eta in this interval. Then, v of eta changes sign at most once. This can be seen from the picture. Let me add some explanation. Since v of eta can only jump up, not jump down. If v of eta crosses zero, continuously, then v of eta will be zero for some eta. in this interval. But then, it will fall into the case number one. So in the case number two, this should not happen. And the only case where this V of eta can ever change its sign is when there is a jump up. This curve will not just peacefully, continuously cross zero at some point eta in this interval. That will not happen. And if it jumps up twice, then by the mean value theorem, in the middle, there must be a point where this uh, v of eta hits zero. I hope this uh, explanation makes sense. If not, please let me know in the comments. I will try to explain again to you. Now we will estimate the integral of the f value of v of eta from zeta to zeta plus delta based on these two cases. For case number one, namely v of eta naught equal to zero, for some 
is not in the interval from zeta to zeta plus delta minus alpha, we shall split the integral into three parts. And let's analyze these three parts separately. First, for the part it not to a not plus alpha, we can bound it by alpha squared divided by 2 plus big O of 1 over 8 naught. This is precisely theorem for 36. Theorem for 36. Where we use that eta is the root of v. Now what about the first integral and the third integral? To estimate these two integrals, we first recall by the inequality 22.15.10, which says that the absolute value of v of eta is bounded by alpha times little of 1, which is the quantity that will go to 0 as the variable psi goes to infinity. So in our setting, by 22.15.10, v of eta is bounded by alpha plus little of 1. For the variable eta, in the interval from zeta to it naught, union the interval from a naught plus alpha to zeta plus delta. Note that the lower bound for this uh, union of two intervals is zeta, and eta lives in here. So this little of 1 will go to 0 as zeta goes to infinity. Now, applying this upper bound for the integrand in the first and the third integral yields And by cancellation, what is left from here is simply delta minus alpha. Now we add up these two upper bounds together. And let's simplify this. But as I stated at the beginning, the choice of delta will be bigger than alpha. So this part is really bounded by delta times little of 1. And moreover, this delta is a fixed absolute constant. Alpha is actually an absolute constant. We already know alpha as a supremum of the absolute value of v of c is finite. This is a fixed absolute constant. And so is delta. Therefore, you can throw away this absolute constant. On the other hand, because this is not is bigger than zeta. So 1 over 8 naught will be bounded by 1 over zeta. But the zeta is a sufficiently large number, which means this guy will also be a little of 1. 
as zeta goes to infinity. So we can combine these two further together. And from here, let me just do one more step. We'll pull out this uh, delta outside. And later, we're going to define this guy as our alpha prime. But at this point, you don't have to memorize that this is alpha prime. You will see again this thing later. This finishes the estimate in the case number one. Now let's turn to the case number two. In this case, the function v of eta changes sign at the most once in that interval. If v of eta changes sign just once at the point eta equal to at one in the interval from zeta to zeta plus delta minus alpha, which contains this eight one. We have by our lemma the theorem for thirty five the uniform bound theorem that the integral of this absolute value can be split into two parts. And now, because the function only changes sign once at this point, we can drop this absolute value sign here because on these two intervals, this function is either always negative or always positive. So we can put the absolute value sign outside of the integral. And now we can safely apply theorem 435. By this theorem, uniform bound, these two are both bounded by a1, and together they are bounded by twice of a1. So this is the case when v of eta changes sign just once. Because v of eta change the sign at most once. So the other case must be v of eta does not change sign at all. That is actually an easier case. Then the same integral here will be equal to the integral where you move the absolute value sign outside, which by theorem 435 is bounded by a1. So in either case, the generous bound for this integral is twice of a1. And we will use that bound next. Hence, the integral from zeta to zeta plus delta of the absolute value of v of eta d eta let's split this integral into two parts one from zeta to zeta plus delta minus alpha and the other from zeta plus delta minus alpha to zeta plus delta the first part based on two subcases in case 2, is always bounded by the more generous bound twice of a1. So this is less than or equal to twice of a1 plus over the second part. To bound the second part, we're going to use 22.15.10 again to bound the integrand 
by alpha plus little of one. And by the same reasoning as we argued in case number one, this little of one will still go to zero as zeta go to infinity. So by 22.15.10, this is upper bounded by 2a1 plus this guy minus this is alpha times an upper bound for the integrand, which is upper bounded by alpha plus little of 1, where this quantity goes to 0 as zeta goes to infinity. Because this eta is between these two numbers, and the delta minus alpha is positive. So this guy will go to 0 as zeta goes to infinity. And now, let's do a small trick by pulling out a delta from here, as we have done at the end of the case number 1. Now, we compare this with our result from case number 1. This was what we obtained from the case number 1. Now, I'm ready to review the reason for our choice of this delta from the beginning. Why did we make this choice? That choice for delta was obtained by setting this guy equal to this guy, so that you get just one bound for this integral in either case. Solving this equation for delta yields delta equal to 2a1 divided by alpha plus 0 2 alpha. This is a number bigger than alpha. And this number is precisely our choice from the beginning. And we put of prime equal to alpha minus alpha squared divided by 2 delta, which is a number less than alpha. And this is exactly what is in these two parentheses. And we will use this later. It follows that in either case, this integral is bounded by delta times alpha prime plus little of 1. Where little of 1 goes to 0 as zeta goes to infinity. This verifies it. our first goal in this section. And now, we will try to conclude this guy. To estimate this integral using this bound, we are going to use the following trick. We are going to subdivide this domain of integration into small intervals of length equal to delta. How many such small intervals are there in the subdivision? Roughly, there will be capital M equal to cosine divided by delta floor many. So we denote this integral by m, and this integral will be equal to plus the remainder term 
the integral from m delta to psi of v of eta at the value v eta. Now we apply this estimate to this integral for each m. And for the second part, we're just going to use the trivial bound for it. The trivial bound is that first, psi minus m times delta is less than or equal to delta. So this guy is always less than or equal to delta. And the integrand, this is function v, is always a bounded number. So this integral will be bounded by a delta times big of 1. which is again a big of 1. So because this guy is less than equal to delta, and delta is an absolute constant, as we put here. So we can merge this guy into big of 1. So let me just erase it. Now let's continue to see what this sum will give us. The sum is equal to our prime times delta times how many terms? m terms plus little o of capital M plus big O of 1. This guy, because delta times m is always less than or equal to psi. So first term is bounded by of prime psi. What about this thing? What is little of m? Note that this big M times delta is less than or equal to psi. So this is also little o of psi. as C goes to infinity. But big of 1 as a bounded number is also little of C. So we can merge these two together. And with this, we finish the proof of our second goal. And now we are ready to conclude a contradiction. You should feel excited at this point because this is the very end of the proof of the prime number theorem. Hence, our beta, which is defined as the limb soup of this average, now you divide both sides by psi. What do you see? You see this is bounded above by of prime. We will divide both sides by psi and let psi go to infinity. This little part divided by psi will go to zero. So this is less than or equal to of prime. But by our choice of of prime, that alpha prime is less than alpha. So we conclude that beta is less than alpha. But this is the contradiction to the result that alpha is less than or equal to beta in the previous section. And the source of this contradiction comes from the assumption that alpha is positive. Therefore, alpha cannot be positive, so alpha must be zero, and that is precisely what we need for the prime number theorem. So with this, we finally 
finish the proof of the prime number theorem. If you have watched this video series this far, I would like to say congratulations and thank you. Thank you for your patience. As we did with the chip shift theorem, let us state and prove a corollary of prime number theorem, which gives an estimate of how large the nth prime is in the increasing enumeration of primes. To prove this, we simply put x equal to p sub n in the prime number theorem. Then it follows that p sub n divided by log of p sub n is similar to pi of p sub n. But pi of p sub n by definition is precise to n. So this is precise the number of primes less than or equal to p sub n, which is n. Then it follows that if you divide both sides by n, this ratio we go to 1 as n goes to infinity. Now we take the log of both sides. It follows that log of this quotient pn divided by n times log of p sub n comes from 0 as n goes to infinity. But if we break this down and we divide both sides by log of p sub n, it still goes to 0 and it simplifies it to And this guy will go to 0 as p sub n goes to infinity because there are infinitely many primes. So it follows that this part converges to 1, namely log of n divided by log of p sub n converges to 1. And therefore, it falls from that n is similar to p sub n divided by log of p sub n, that p sub n is similar to n times log of p sub n, and uh, using this, we conclude that p sub n is similar to n times log of it, and we're done. So, how large is the nth prime? It is roughly n times log of it.